Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize that this assignment's going to involve my trying to solve my own murder. Morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you had an assignment for me. You know, you're looking pretty good after all. Thanks. This morning. You look dandy, too. Any reason why I shouldn't look all right? Well, according to all the known laws of medical science, right now you should be looking bad. Yeah, why? Last night you dropped dead. Oh, well, if that's all of... Huh? I dropped dead? That's what I said. Well, <laughs> it was certainly the most painless death I ever had anyway. Now, look, Commissioner... I don't know what this is all about, but it's a little early in the morning for jokes, wouldn't you think? Uh, this is no joke. Ever hear of Roquel? No, it sounds like something for a sour stomach. Roquel is the name of the town in South America where you were murdered last night. Murdered? <laughs> Here we go again. Now, wait a minute. Steve, a man was shot to death in an alley there last night. He was carrying a complete set of credentials which identified him as Steve Mitchell, U.S. government agent. I see. Any idea who this guy really was or why he was posing None at me? at all. But he was undoubtedly involved in something big, something which required him to pass himself off as a U.S. agent. Oh, and you want to know what that something is, huh? I certainly do, because I have a strong hunch that whatever it is, there's an aroma connected with it that's not very sweet. Uh, Any contacts down there who can help me? When you arrive in Roquel, I suggest you talk to an American correspondent named Kavanaugh. He seems to know as much about the incident as anyone right now. Now, Steve, get down there, talk to Kavanaugh, and then get to the bottom of this whole deal. Well, I see it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. The National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. In all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Sure, I've got my assignment. Just run down to the little town of Rokel in South America and find out who killed me and why. At this point, it sure looks like somebody doesn't like my name much. One man's already been killed just for assuming it. That gives me an uneasy hunch about what's ahead for me, the real owner. It's Wednesday when the plane lands at Roquel, and I find the American correspondent, Kavanaugh, in the nearest bar. <laughs> well, now I've seen everything, Mitchell. A corpse comes wandering around to find out who killed him. Yeah. And what I'm wondering right now is why I ever picked this flea bitten town to get myself knocked off in. <laughs> you really must have been hard up for a spot, believe me. Hey, look, Kavanaugh. This guy who got himself killed, did he look anything like me? No, no. He was an American, too, but that's about all. But those credentials he had, I got a look at him, and they sure like, looked like the real McCoy to me. Yeah? What do you think the guy's anger was, Mitchell? That's what I'm down here to find out. What can you tell me about the actual shooting? Well, it took place in the alley right outside this bar. Oh? Were you in here at the time? <laughs> Where else? Silly question. Well, go on. I heard a shot. I ran outside. The guy was lying on the ground. Somebody was bending over him. Oh? Looked to me like he was trying to get something out of the dead man's pockets. Did you get a good look at him? No, it was too dark. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure it was even a him. I see. This guy's body at the morgue? Yeah, yeah. Come on, I'll take you over there. Well, you were right, Kavanaugh. He looks like an American, all right, but there's sure not much resemblance to me. You seen the nut? Yeah. I'd like to take a look at those phony credentials. You happen to know who's got them now? Well, the police, I imagine. Hmm. Okay, I'll check there. Hey, you know who those people are who just came in, Kavanaugh? They seem to be heading this way. Well, the stocky guy in the uniform is Colonel Gomez, head of the National Police. Oh, but I've never seen the other guy or the dame before. But I'm certain, Colonel, that he was not involved in anything criminal. That is for us to determine, Senora. Hello, Colonel. Oh, Senor Kavanaugh, the American journalist. Colonel, I've got someone here I know you'll be interested in meeting. 
The real Steve Mitchell. So, <gasps> glad to know you, Colonel Gomez. And are you, senor? I am indeed happy you have been sent down here to help us clear up this mystery. Well, looks like I didn't go over so well with the little lady here. She has indeed good cause for alarm at being confronted by you, Senor Mitchell. Oh, so? Because this is your wife. It's my... <laughs> well, I seem to have pretty good taste. By which I mean to say that this woman is Senora Maria Mitchell, wife of the man who was posing as yourself. And this is her brother, Senor Miguel Escobar. Escobar? Senor? Senora, how long was your husband using my name? But I did not know he was using anyone's name, senor. I thought it was his own. He was using it when I first met him. Oh? How long ago was that? A little over a month. Only a month? And yet you were married to him? Senor, if you are casting reflections upon my sister, you will answer to me. Escobar, I'm not casting reflections on anyone. I'm just trying to find out a few facts. You will answer, senor Mitchell, senora Mitchell. I mean, senora... Well, answer him. Si, It was true. I had not known him long. And I met him in a cantina, a a bar. Everything was against us. And yet I loved him. And now he's dead. Uh, yeah. Look, have you any idea what your husband could have been involved in? Senor, can you not see that this is a very bad time to question my sister? I insist that you... Look, Escobar, a guy using my name has been killed. It's important to me to find out if he was killed because he was using my name. If so, whoever did it will be trying to do likewise to me. So suppose you just button up your... I am merely trying to protect my sister. I wonder. What do you mean by that? Senor Escobar, you will hold your tongue. Senor Mitchell has every right to ask any questions he desires. Thanks, Colonel, but I guess that'll be all for now. I would like to look at the dead man's effects, however. But of course, if you will come with me into the next room... I'll be out here when you're through, Mitchell. Okay, Kavanaugh. The effects are on the table. Yeah. Well, not much here to give us a lead. Cigarettes, matches, money, key. Yeah, wonder what the key's for. The dead man's apartment. I searched it personally, but could find nothing that might throw any light on this matter. I see. Mind if I take the key? But of course not. It is possible you may find something that I may have missed. Colonel Gomez, what do you think this is all about? I wish I knew, Mitchell. It's all very perplexing. Yeah, anything cooking in this country in the way of intrigue or anything like that? Not that I know of, and I am certain I would know if there were. You see, Mitchell, as head of the National Police, I am actually second in command, well, President. I see. Okay, Colonel. I'm going over to the dead man's apartment. I'll see you later. I head for the dead man's apartment, letting myself in with a key, and I give the room a frisk. But the only items of interest are a couple of matchbooks with the name of a bar on them La Posada. The door. I go over and open it. Standing in the hall is a small, middle-aged, nervous-looking gent. Are you Senor Mitchell? Okay. So how do I answer that one? Does he mean am I the phony Mitchell or the real Mitchell? I guess I hesitate too long because he suddenly whips a gun out of his pocket. I dive at him just as the gun goes off. A hot streak sears its way across the top of my head and I go down. I come out of it a few minutes later, complete with a red-hot crease on the top of my head. The little trigger man, of course, is gone. I go outside and start down the main street. Then I spot a sign over a door, La Posada. The same bar on the match fold is in the dead man's apartment. I go inside. (laughs) Out in the center of the floor, a girl has just finished her dance. One look at her and I can see why the ovation. I go over to the bar. Si, senor. Uh, cerveza? No, information. Uh, this comes in a bottle? Hey, look. Did you ever see a guy named Steve Mitchell around here? Mitchell? 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 You don't have to memorize it. Just tell me if you've ever seen him in here before. Mitchell! You remember him? I don't think so. Thanks a lot. About that, uh, I ask George. Maybe George remembers. Who's he? Who, who is he? Who's he? <laughs> Hey, brother, my routines are hilarious. I could make a fortune down here, huh? Now, look, Giggles, what's so funny? George! George, come here a minute. The senor wants to talk to you. Thank you, bartender. I... Hey, wait a minute. Hello. You're the dancer. See. Si. Don't tell me your name is George. Okay, George, don't tell him. Okay, card. How did you ever get a handle like that? Senor. I mean, a name like that. The Tarista. One of them start calling me George, so now everybody call me George. Now, what you want and why you don't buy me a drink, eh? Well, 
later. Right now, I'd like to know if you've ever seen a guy named Steve Mitchell in here. That bum. Yeah? Uh-huh. Real imposter, huh? Hmm? Do you know anything about him? Not much. He spend money, take trips. Trips? What kind of trips? I don't know. He used to go to the interior once in a while. But now I don't see him for a while, and that's okay with me. So why we don't quit talking about this, Mitchell, huh? What's your name, buddy? You'd never believe it, George. So maybe we'd just better skip it and have a drink, huh? With me, good, buddy. Hey, Steve. I've been looking all over for you. Oh, Carol, now, what's up? Well, you can quit looking for the guy who killed you. Oh? You know, I don't think I hear so good. There's nothing wrong with your hearing, George, if it sounds confusing. It's because it is. So why can't I quit looking for the guy who killed me, Kavanaugh? Because he's down at the police station right now. What? Yeah, yeah, he just walked in and confessed. Colonel Gomez has him in that room down the hall, Mitchell. Okay. Now if we can just find out from him why he killed this guy who was posing as me. Well, here we are. That's him. The little guy sitting there. Hey! Senor Mitchell, you're still alive. It sure isn't your fault I am, Buster. Hey, what's this all about? See, si, Senor Mitchell, perhaps you will be good enough to explain. It's very simple, Colonel Gomez. While I was searching the dead man's apartment an hour ago, this little character showed up at the door and asked if I was Steve Mitchell. While I was trying to figure out whether he meant the real Mitchell or the phony Mitchell, he pulled a gun. I dove for him and deflected his aim a little, and he creased my head and took off. I, I, I would have sworn you were dead. But what is this about the real Mitchell and the phony Mitchell, Mitchell? Night before last, the man, posing as myself, got killed in an alley. When Kavanaugh told me you'd walked in here and confessed, I figured you were the one who killed him. But I did not even know of the existence of this other man. When I confessed a few minutes ago, it was because I thought I'd killed you at that apartment. You know, somebody better start explaining this to me. It's getting to sound more like a Chinese puzzle by the second C. And it is also quite embarrassing, Senor Mitchell. How so, Colonel? This little character, as you call him, this man who shot at you, is Senor Morilla, a respected member of our National Assembly and a loyal supporter of our government. What? Oh, this was going to look great in print. I was convinced that I was acting in the best interest of my country, Senor Mitchell. I repeat that I did not know a man had been impersonating you. That, of course, explains everything. Well, I'm glad to hear it makes sense to somebody. Senor Morilla, a statement from you would be in order. Very well, Colonel. You see, for some time now, I have been concerned with the bands of rebels who are hiding in our mountains. Those rebels, again, you should realize, Senor Morilla, they are not powerful Allow enough. me to finish, Colonel Gomez. I planted one of my men in that camp to find out what they were doing. This man reported to me that a certain Senor Steve Mitchell had been going from camp to camp, promising United States backing to the rebels and offering to sell them guns and ammunition. What is this you are saying? Don't stop him now, Colonel. The deal is just starting to make sense. I was deeply shocked and bitter at what I considered to be the vile treachery of this man and of the United States, whom he claimed to represent. I learned his address here in the city. When I rang the doorbell, you answered the door, Senor Mitchell. I assumed you were the man I sought and fired at you. I... I can only say now that I am covered with shame. Well, it'll wash off. Right now, I'd like to hear a little more about these rebels in the interior. Well, that's always been sort of a touchy subject around here, Mitchell. You see, there's some people who sympathize with these rebels who believe that... Senor the... Cavanaugh, allow me to point out that when it comes to the affairs of this country, you are an outsider. If there are any statements to be made concerning these rebels, I will make them. Well, that suits me, Colonel. And speaking of statements, uh, didn't your president make one a couple of months ago? To the effect that he intended to sit down with the leaders of the rebel bands and see if their differences and grievances couldn't be ironed out peaceably? I believe some such statement was issued to the press. Well, I don't remember those talks ever taking place. How come? Because I advised El Presidente against it. Oh? See, si. I considered it beneath the dignity of the government to recognize such rabble. <laughs> you know, that's the funny thing about rabble, Colonel. It can get pretty powerful. Indeed. You speak as an expert in such matters, Senor Carlo. Uh, just an observation. This rebel did not used to be powerful. Now, we have known for some time that the rebels would like to march on the city. But they have always been low on guns and leadership. Now, however, it appears to be a different story. An enemy of my government is trying to arm this riffraff. Then it is possible they might feel strong enough to make their move. A move which would plunge our country into a bloody civil war. No, Morilla. This will never happen as long as I, Gomez, am alive. You must remember that I control the militia. I will search out these rebels in the hills and smash them now, all of them, before they can organize. There's one big thing wrong with that idea, Colonel. And what is that? A lot of people would be killed. If you mean the armed rebels, then I say good riddance. I think I've got a better idea. Suppose someone went into the interior, located the headquarters of the rebels, and talked to their leaders. 
Talk to them? Yeah, told them that this fake Steve Mitchell was exploiting them and that the whole thing is a racket. Senor Mission, whom do you have in mind to make this trip into the interior? Myself. You? Why not, Marilla? You're tired of living, maybe? Not particularly, Kevin, or why? Well, those boys in the interior are pretty rugged. I'll take my chances that they listen to me. That sounds like a pretty crazy idea to me. Oh? Maybe you don't want me to make the trip, huh, Kevin? Me? Why should I care one way or another? You know, that's just what I was wondering. Senor Mitchell... I appreciate the generosity of your offer, but I am afraid I cannot permit you to take the risk. Look, Colonel, my government has been dragged into this deal by that dead gun peddler and whoever is behind him. I think they'd feel a lot better if one of their agents could help straighten the thing out without bloodshed. I do not know. According to my information, the rebel headquarters are well hidden. Well, with time, I might be able to locate them. And there is the matter of the security of my government. If these rebels are armed, they must be smashed now. I feel I should give the order to the militia to search them out and destroy them. I'm asking you to delay the order until I've had a chance to talk to them. Very well. I will delay the order 12 hours. Mm, That's not very much. I can give you no more, senor. 12 hours in which to locate the rebels' headquarters and to undertake your journey. One which I sincerely hope will not turn out to be a one-way trip. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. For something new about the Army, hear the Phil Regan Show tomorrow on NBC. Coming from a different service base every week, Phil Regan brings you songs and fun and brings prizes to talented GIs. It's an exciting newcomer in your Sunday chime lineup on NBC. Also, Sunday means Cary Grant and Betsy Drake as Mr. and Mrs. Blanding. Now back to Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. So now I've got just 12 hours to prevent a civil war from breaking out. That means I've got to locate the rebel headquarters in a hurry. Then I remember George, the dancing girl. Maybe she can give me a lead. I hurry back to the bar where she works. Look, buddy, don't waste my time no more. The last time you were in here, you were going to buy me a drink. So what happens? All of a sudden, poof, you're gone. Yeah, yeah, I got called away in a hurry. Now, look, George, I need a little information about this guy, Steve Mitchell, who used to come in here. I tell you, I don't want to talk about that bum. You say he made frequent trips into the interior. Do you happen to know where? No. He wanted to take me a couple of times, but never I would go. Well, that's not much help. Do you happen to know how he made the trips? I mean, did he fly, take a boat, what? What? Huh? He drove an automobile. I see. Well, that's still not much to go on. All the time, a different color. What's that? One time he come by to ask me to go with him, he's driving a blue car. Yeah? Next time, a black car. Mm-hmm. And once he was driving a green car. I almost went with him then. I like green. Mm, sounds like he rented the cars for the trips. Okay, George, thanks. Hey, wait a minute, buddy. What's the matter? So don't tell me now you're going to poof off your go again without buying me a drink. I don't think this is much of a friendship. Here. You think this will make up for the poof? Oh, senor. For this, you got an extra poof coming. Like I told you, I like green. I start scouring the town for car rental agencies, and I find three of them. At the first two, I draw blanks. Finally, along about dark, I work my way to the third, and the old gent in charge is sitting in a little office fighting a brave but losing battle to stay awake. What was that the name again? Mitchell. Steve Mitchell. Mitchell. Come on, Buster. Alfredo. Okay, Alfredo. Now prop open those peepers long enough to tell me whether or not a guy named Steve Mitchell ever rented a car from you. Steve Mitchell. Oh, see, he rented a car from me. How long ago? Oh, two or three days. Which car did he rent the last time? Over, over there, the green one. Huh? It's a nice car. You like to rent it, maybe? Hey, hey, hey. Come on, come on. Snap out of it. I'm so comfortable and I'm so tired. Yeah, yes, oh, my. You keep uh, mileage figures on your cars? Well, see, they're on the wall, senor. If you don't mind, you reach it, huh? Huh? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Here we are. Speedometer reading. Let's see. A car traveled a total of about 400 kilometers on the trip. Okay, you got a map? Hey. Hmm? Map, map. Oh, see, up on the shelf. Okay, I got it. 
Now, let's say car traveled a total of 400 kilometers, 200 there and back. So if I use this point as a center and draw a circle within a radius of 200 kilometers... Uh, there. That looks pretty. Thanks. Now, somewhere near the rim of that circle is a spot he traveled to. Hmm. Circle goes through some pretty rugged country, and from the looks of that car, it's been washed since he brought it back. See, this morning. So there's no clay or mud on it to give me a clue as to what kind of country he traveled through. Senor, huh? uh, but why you draw this pretty circle on the map and play the riddle games with yourself? It doesn't happen to be a game, Alfredo. I'm trying to figure out what spot in the interior this guy went to, and right now it doesn't look like I'm getting very far. Yeah, but, but if you want to know where he went, I will tell you. What? See, si, the village of San Bruno. How did you figure that out? Because he tell me. Well, why didn't you say so before? You didn't ask me. Okay, okay, so I am the sleepy one, I guess. San Bruno, huh? Well, thank you, and sweet dreams, Alfredo. I get a block down the street, and then I realize I've forgotten to ask Alfredo if that guy ever took anyone with him to San Bruno. I go back. Alfredo Stilson sitting in the same spot, his head on his arms. Didn't take him long to get back to sleep. I shake him, but he doesn't come out of it. I lift up his head, and then I see why. How can you wake up when your throat has been cut? Now I know whoever's behind this deal is keeping up with me every step of the way, and I realize this isn't the healthiest spot in the world for me right now. I get out of there fast. The streets are dark and deserted, and I take Avenida Ruiz, one of the streets that leads to my hotel, and then as I'm walking along, I hear some steps behind me. I stop. They stop, too. I start walking again. So does the other guy. I stop again. This time, the other guy keeps coming. Suddenly, I see a glint of metal in the shadows, and I hit the ground. The slug bounces off the wall behind me. Before I can get a look at the trigger man, he ducks into the alley. I scramble to my feet and take off after him, but when I get into the alley, there's no one in sight. I pound through the alley to the next block, and then I spot a guy running across the square. He passes under a streetlight, and I get a look at his face. It's a newspaper correspondent, Kavanaugh. So, at this point, it looks like he's my boy, but right now I'm more interested in getting to the rebel headquarters of San Bruno because I know my time is running out. I phone the airport and tell them I'm on my way out. When I get there, they've got a transport plane warming up, and Colonel Gomez is waiting for me. Uh, good evening, Senor Mitchell. What luck? Pretty good, Colonel Gomez. I think I've located the rebels' headquarters. Splendid. Where is it? Well, if my information's correct, it's near the village of San Bruno in the interior, and I think my information is correct because... Somebody sure didn't want me to find that out. What do you mean? The guy who told me got his throat slit right afterwards. I see. San Bruno. It is wild country, Mitchell. Yeah? But there is an emergency landing strip not far from the village. Incidentally, Colonel, how come you're wearing a flight jacket? I am to be your pilot, Senor Mitchell. Oh? See, si. You are making this trip to help my country. I feel the least I can do is share the responsibility and the danger. Okay, Colonel. Thanks. Hey, how huh? about taking a passenger? Kavanaugh. Well, how about it? You uh, think maybe you might get another chance to kill me up on that plane, huh, Kavanaugh? What? What are you talking about? Don't tell me that wasn't you I saw running across that square near my hotel right after that shot was fired at me. Mitchell. Sure. Sure, that was me. You promised me an exclusive on this deal, remember? Yeah. So when you started shagging around investigating, I thought I'd better follow you to keep posted. Oh? I heard the shot. I saw a guy duck into an alley, so I started chasing him. That's what I was doing, running across the square when you spotted me. But needless to say, he got away, huh? He sure oh, did. Mitchell, you did not tell me of this attempt on your life. When did it happen? Uh, about a half an hour ago, Colonel. I was walking along the street towards my hotel when somebody took a shot at me. I see. You were fortunate to escape with your life. At Avenida Ruiz, it is a perfect spot for ambush. Poorly lit, several alleys. Uh, yeah. You still haven't told me whether or not I get to go with you on this trip. No soap, Kavanaugh. Well, now, nah, that's just fine, that is. You know, Mitchell, you could take a few lessons in gratitude. Yeah? Well, maybe you could take a few from one eye Connolly. Come on, Colonel. <laughs> the Colonel and I head for the control tower to check the weather. Ten minutes later, we take off. The colonel heads the transport in the direction of San Bruno, and pretty soon we're flying over some dense jungle. Senor Mitchell, I did not understand your remark to Senor Cavanaugh before we took off. Who is this one-eyed Connolly you refer to? Uh, just a character up in the States, Colonel. And I do not understand why, if Cavanaugh is the man who tried to kill you, you did not want him arrested. I didn't have any proof, Colonel. 
Anyway, I figured it was more important for us to get to San Bruno and talk to the rebel leaders. You are still convinced you can prevent a civil war, Mitchell? I am still convinced it's worth a try, Colonel. How much longer until we get there? As a matter of fact, Mitchell, you might say we are there right now. Eh? I don't see anything but jungle down there. I mean, how much longer to the end of the trip? And I repeat, you have already reached the end of your trip. Hey, now look, I... Well, that gun says you mean just what you say, too. Indeed it does. So you're my boy, Colonel Gomez. At this point, it would appear that you are my boy, Mitchell. And you're the one who was backing the sale of guns to the rebels, huh? Why? That does not concern you now, Mitchell. You're second in command of your government. You wouldn't by any chance be bucking for number one spot, would you? I would indeed, Mitchell. Sure. You hire a guy to sell guns to the rebels and promise them U.S. support. That gets them steamed up to fight. Then you go in with more troops and better weapons and wipe them out. All of a sudden, you're a national hero. Up comes an election and it's Gomez for president. You trace my future career with great accuracy. Well, so what happens to me now, Gomez? It is quite simple. First, I shoot you. Andy. Then I push your body out of the plane. Then I fly back and announce that the rebels have killed you. And, of course, you'll use that as an excuse to move in with your troops. Exactly. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Colonel, but that's not exactly the way it's going to work out. Indeed, and why not, may I ask? We're going to fly back to the Capitol, explain the whole thing. You're going to stand trial for murder, and five will get you ten. Your president will sit down and talk to the rebels and straighten everything out peacefully. (laughs) You'll think I'm kidding. I enjoy your sense of humor. A man who is powerless, yet you can make jokes. The joke's on you, Colonel. You see, a transport's a pretty good-sized plane. What do you mean? Just that we're not alone. What? If you don't believe me, look behind you. Oh. Oh, no, my friend. That is the oldest trick in the world. I will not fall for it. He ain't kidding, Colonel. Why, Kavanaugh! Thanks for turning your head, Gomez. Let's go. <laughs> that, my friend, is what I would call a first-class clip. Now then, there's just one thing I want to know. What? Can you fly this tub? Look, Ma, I'm doing it, ain't I? <laughs> I wasn't sure whether or not you got the message back at the airfield, Kavanaugh. Well, when you mentioned one-eyed Conley, the world's greatest gate crasher, I figured you wanted me to copy his act. So I crawled aboard while you two were in the control tower. But uh, what made you suspect the colonel? When I told him about the attempt on my life, he said the Avenida Ruiz was a dangerous street. Remember? But I hadn't told him where it had happened. I see. Well, I'll bet he'll be kicking himself for being such an eager beaver. He won't be worrying about that very long. Why, what do you mean? I've got a strong hunch that eager beaver is due to turn into a dead duck. Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Chondo, with music by Robert Armbruster, and is produced and directed by Bill Karn. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another dangerous assignment. chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow, there's another gala broadcast of The Big Show as hostess Tallulah Bankhead welcomes Jimmy Durante, Evelyn Knight, Bob Burns, and many more. Also on Sunday, Theater Guild brings you the delightful story The Hasty Heart, starring John Lund, Jane Wyatt, and Richard Green. Now, it's The Man Called X on NBC. Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble. 
When I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize this assignment's going to wind up with me playing the little kid's game of King of the Mountain. The only difference is, in this game I'm playing, whoever loses gets killed. Morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you had an assignment for me. I do, Steve. Well, what's the deal this time? You'll be looking for a piece of paper that's vital to us right now. Oh? Somebody steal it? Yes. What is it, a secret treaty or something like that? No, it's a hospital temperature chart. Uh, hey, you know, for a minute I thought you that's said... just what I did say, a hospital temperature chart. And a complete set of medical records. Now, look, Commissioner, fun is fun, This but... is no joke, Steve. You know, I think you're a serious... You bet I am. Well, in that case, you better start at the beginning. Whose medical records are they, and why are they so important? Steve, see this map of Eastern Europe, this country? Yeah, what about it? For some time, it's been torn apart politically. During the last few years, a popular leader has arisen who's been able to do the one thing nobody else has before him. To unite his country under a democratic form of government. You're talking about Carl Zander? That's right. You have any idea where Zander is right now? Why, it seems to me I read that he was taking a vacation somewhere in the Austrian Alps. Steve, Carl Zander is a patient at the Whittington Clinic right here in the United States. What? Yes, it's been a very closely guarded secret, or rather it was, up until a few days ago. Wait a minute, you said there were some medical records stolen. Were they Zander's records? Yes, how they found out Zander was in the clinic, we don't know, but they did. And hired a man to steal the records. We know the man's name, and we've got a description of it. But who'd want to steal medical records? And Steve Carl Zander is a very sick man. The uh, specialists at the clinic are all agreed he'll pull through, but right now you'd never be able to tell that by looking at his medical records. I think I'm beginning to get it, Commissioner. Isn't there an election coming up in a couple of weeks in Zandor's country? That's right, Steve. Imagine what would happen if a highly organized minority in that country plastered copies of those medical reports all over the front page. They could make it look as if Xander was dying. That would cause the defeat of Xander's party. And three years of building toward democracy would go down the drain. I see. That makes those medical records pretty hot, Commissioner. Xander has asked for our cooperation, Steve. I told him we'd do everything we possibly can. You say you know who swiped the records from the clinic. Yes, a man named Duvac. He posed as a grocery truck driver to gain admittance to the clinic. Any idea where Duvac is now? I think he's on a ship named the Southern Empress en route to the Portuguese colony of Macau on the China coast. Sort of taking a roundabout way, isn't he? Yes, and we think it's to cover his tracks. Well, can't you radio the skipper of the ship? No. This thing has to be kept absolutely quiet, Steve. So I'm elected to fly over to Macau and meet the boat, huh? Yes, and your plane leaves in one hour. You'll just barely make it to Macau before the boat loads. Any contacts over there who can help me? One, the Lieutenant Braga of the police. Steve, get over to Macau. Work with Braga. Intercept Duvac, and above all, get those records back. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. The National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Well, I've chased a lot of strange things in my time, but never a set of medical records. On the surface, it sounds like a cinch, but I've got an uneasy feeling that before the deal's over, somebody will be making out a set of medical records on me. It's Monday evening when my plane lands in Macau. I check with Police Lieutenant Braga, and the two of us head for the waterfront. We get there just in time to see the Southern Empress docking. We go aboard and find out from the person that Duvac's cabin is 23B. Hey, you're meet you there. Have a description of this man, Duvac? Yes, Lieutenant Braga. I've got a picture of him right here in my pocket. Oh, I might observe, Senor, that the simplicity of this assignment makes it a refreshing change from the ordinary run of things for, for me here in Manacao. Oh, yeah? We know who our man is. We have a description of him. We know his stateroom number. So, we arrest him and recover the papers you seek. And it is all over. Well, I hope you're right. Here we are. Two, three, B. Hey, the door is ajar. Mitchell. Yeah? Man, lying on the floor. Yeah, come on. Is he dead? No, unconscious. Who is he? Search me. He isn't Duvac. That's a cinch. Come on, Buster. Snap out of it. Braga, how about getting that pitcher of water over there? Very well. 
strange, too, that he should be lying there in his undershirt. Yeah. Looks like the deal isn't going to be quite as easy as we figured, Braga. Mm. Here you are, Mitchell. Thanks. Well, looks like the water was what you needed, Buster. Come on now, snap out of it. Well, I'm... That's what we'd like to know. Who are you? Uh, I'm the steward. I was called in here by Mr. Duvac to get his luggage. I opened the door. That's the last I remember. Wait a minute. Where's my white coat? My cap? Major. Yeah, looks like Duvac figured he'd have a better chance of getting ashore unnoticed if he dressed as a steward. Come. I have men stationed on the pier. We will check with him. But none of Braga's men remember seeing a man in a steward's uniform come ashore. Of course, he could have slipped by in the dark. Braga orders the whole area patrol. But all of a sudden, I get a different hunch. If Duvac is this smart, maybe he's even smarter. I go back aboard the Southern Empress and look up the captain who's still up on the bridge. I'm afraid I don't understand, Mitchell. If this man Duvac has already slipped ashore in a steward's uniform, why... Maybe he has, Captain. But on the other hand, maybe that's what he wants us to think he's done. I see. Well, you have my permission to search the ship. Of course, that'll take quite a while. There's a lot of places where a man could hide. I know. That's why I like to stay up here on the bridge. What do you mean? Well, from here I can watch the side of the ship. Oh, you figure that he... Wait a minute. What is it? Seems to me I just saw something come out of one of those portholes down there. Oh, rather hard to see in the dark. Yeah. Want me to turn on the searchlight? No, no, not yet. Yes, I see it now. It's a rope dangling from the porthole. And somebody's starting to climb down it. Okay, Captain, hit that searchlight. Right. There he goes, climbing down the rope to the water. Dilvac, hold it! Mitchell, he let go of the rope and dropped to the water. Yeah. What are you doing? I'm going after him, Captain. Keep that light on him. I dive for a spot a few feet away from Dilvac. The water hits me like a hand across the face. When I come up, Duvac is swimming for the center of the channel. I take off after him. Start gaining. Half a dozen more strokes and I've got him. Let go of me! Come on, Duvac, we're going back to the ship. Okay, you want to play rough? Now I'll oblige you. I jerk my head around just in time to see a tugboat bearing down on us. I try to get Duvac out of the way, but it's too late. Something awful heavy hits me a glancing blow on the side of the head, and all of a sudden, I've had it. What do you think, Captain? I don't know, Lieutenant Braga. The tug didn't hit him square. Sort of a glancing blow. Maybe... Oh. Hey. Sounds like he's starting to come out of it. Mitchell. Mitchell. What? Oh, Lieutenant Braga. Si, senor. And the captain. Hey, look. Where am I? Last... I remember I was in the water watching that tugboat climb my frame. You're back aboard ship, Mitchell. We fished you out just before you went under for the third time. Oh, well, thanks for the lift, I... Hey, what about Duvac? Well, Duvac was not as fortunate as you, Mitchell. Uh, the tugboat hit him squarely. He, he was killed. Did you recover the body? See, si. but the papers you are after, the medical reports, they, they were not on the body. What, are you sure about that? Uh, quite sure. We searched the corpse thoroughly. But that doesn't add up. Look, we know that Duvac had those papers and was trying to get them ashore. He slugged the steward and swiped his uniform to make it look like he was going ashore that way. See, si, and then he tried to leave the ship later by means of the rope down the side. Well, all this we know, Mitchell. But the fact remains, those papers were not on him. Uh, well, I guess that leaves us two possibilities, Braga. What are they? Either those papers are still in Duvac's state rumor, somebody took them ashore for him. In that case, Mitchell. Yeah, in that case, we're falling behind fast. Let's go to work on the first possibility. That the papers are still in Duvac's state room. Yeah, we'll give the place a frisk. Captain, I wonder if you could have that steward meet us in the stateroom. Sure. He might be able to give us a line on whom Duvac was running around with aboard ship. Somebody who might be carrying the mail for him. Well, it appears we may now throw out that first possibility, Mitchell. Yeah, we've gone over this stateroom like a vacuum cleaner, but we sure haven't turned up those papers. Come in. The captain said you wanted to see me, Mr. Yeah, I do, Stuart. Look. Do you happen to know if the dead man, Duvac, was particularly friendly with any of the passengers? Well, I'm afraid I can't help you there. I don't... What is it? Wait a minute. Yeah, I just remembered the, the woman. What woman? Well, an American, I believe. What's her name? Miss, Miss Barlow, I think. Who's Miss Barlow? Uh, one of the passengers. 
I remember seeing Miss Dudovac with her quite frequently the last few days. Happen to know if she smokes? Uh, wh- why, yes. Yes, she does. Why? We found a cigarette butt with lipstick in the ashtray. Oh, I see. Uh, you think this Miss Barlow is the person you're looking for? I don't know. Well, thanks, Stuart. I... <laughs> Looks like we've got company. Oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry. I have made a mistake. Oh, who are you? I, I, my name is Kessler, but I do not see that that concerns you. Maybe it does. Are you looking for something or someone? Why, as a matter of fact, I was a friend of mine. But it is obvious I have the wrong stateroom. I apologize. Yeah, I wonder if he did have the wrong stateroom or not. Mm, so do I. He happens to be a rather unsavory character, Mitchell. Oh, oh, you know him? Yes, he operates a bar here in Macau. Well, it might be a good idea to keep an eye on him. Yes, it would not surprise me to find that he was involved. Uh, he may not have anything to do with it, but we're pretty short of leads right now, so we've got to follow up anything that looks even possible. I agree. I would have his bar watched. Good. In the meantime, I'll check with uh, this Miss Barlow. I believe she's already left the ship, Mr. Mitchell. Oh. Well, in that case, I'll try to locate her ashore. See if I can find out just how good a friend of Duvac she was. <laughs> I check with the purser and learn that Miss Barlow left the ship 20 minutes ago, so I go ashore. On the dock, I see a line of rickshaw boys waiting for passengers. I go over to one of them. When he sees me coming, his face lights up like a pinball game. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, fine, rickshaw, you try, oh, yeah. In a minute, maybe. In a minute, maybe, oh, yeah. Right now, I'd like a little information. Little information, oh, yes. Your mother frightened by a parrot or something? Look, tell me. Did you see a woman come off that ship about 20 minutes ago? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You did? Where'd she go? Oh, yes. Fine rickshaw. You try. Take you strange places with faraway names. Oh, yes. You know, I can see this is not exactly a meeting of the minds. Meeting of minds. Oh, yes. All right. All right. Now, look, Buster. How do you know my name? Huh? Don't tell me your name is Buster. No, name is... Now, look. Oh, fine. Okay, now look, now look. I mean, now... Oh, you call me twice, but there is only one of me. What I'm trying to say... Ah, uh, just take me into town, will you? I check all the hotels in Macau and find out that Miss Barlow registered at the Splendida. I charge over there in my trusty rickshaw and learn that she's in the bar, so I go in and slide on the stool next to her. Well, say... Hmm? Now, isn't that one? Uh, look, maybe I better go out and come in again. Oh, no, silly. I was just wondering what in the world I'd ever do if a strange man came into the bar and sat right down beside me. And along you came in, you know, I didn't even bat a little old eye. Well, now, that's real brave of you, ma'am. And not even a quiver out of your martini, either. Oh, now you're poking fun at me, mister. Uh, Mitchell. Steve Mitchell. Well, I'm Susan Barlow. Oh, taking a vacation, Susan? Taking a vacation? I should say not, Steve. I'm starting a whole new career. That's just how bold I am. Oh, what mm-hmm. kind of a career are you starting? I'm going to travel all around the whole wide world and write down just about every little old thing I see, Steve. Well, that sounds like a pretty big order. <laughs> so you're going to be a writer, huh? Sure enough, I am. You see, Steve, I'm a school teacher in New England, and I decided one day that I whoa, was... Whoa, 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 just a minute. Huh? Where did you say you came from? New England. That's what I thought you said. Well, southern part, of course. Oh, of course. And now I'm just out looking for color, Steve. I see. Did you find any of it on the boat? Did I? Why, you'd never in the world believe it, but I found Probably more. not, but it... how about interesting characters? You meet any of them? I shouldn't have did. A fellow named Duvac, for instance? I don't remember the name particularly. Oh. Of course I met so many people on board. I uh, heard that you and Duvac were pretty friendly. And now, Mr. Mitchell, where I come from... Uh, southern New England, that is. A gentleman takes a lady's word for things. And come to think about it, I don't hanker to answer any more of your nosy old questions. I'm asking you right now to quit testing me, Mr. Mitchell. Else now, I'll, I'll short up report you. Report me? To whom? Never you mind whom. I'll just report you. You know, Miss Corn Pony, that you're sure enough on the level. Or that's a powerful good act you're putting on. And sooner or later, I'm sure enough going to find out which... Three 
chimes mean good times on NBC. There's adventure in the air tomorrow evening as NBC brings you another authentic story of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae stars as a modern-day agent of the law. Times have changed, and the Rangers ride automobiles instead of cayuses, but there's still the same hard-bitten group riding down from the plains of Texas. And also tomorrow, galloping down from the plains of Hollywood, will be the hilarious Harrises to bring you another chaotic, confusing, and delightful domestic saga on the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show. You are listening to Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Well, along about now, I figure it's time to get back with Lieutenant Braga. I find him in the bar owned by Kessler, the man who stuck his nose into Duvok's stateroom. Did you find Miss Barlow, Mitchell? Yeah, I sure did. Well, what about her? That's what I'd like to know. Eh? What do you mean? She's so phony, she must be legit. Phony? Legit? Well, that sounds confusing. Well, if it does, it's because I am. You found out anything about this Kessler? No, and he does not seem to be here in his bar at the moment. Well, it's possible, of course, that Kettler doesn't have anything to do with the deal. He could have been telling us the truth. Maybe he really was looking for a friend and just wandered into Duvok's stateroom by mistake. Yes, that possibility, of course, has occurred to me, too. You know, I'm beginning to think that nothing about this deal makes sense, Braga. Look... Duvok swipes some pretty important medical records back in the States and takes off with them. He comes to Macau aboard the Southern Empress and then tries to make us think he sneaked ashore in the steward's uniform. But actually, he attempts to escape from the ship by means of the rope. Sure, and up to there it all figures. But when you fished his body out of the drink, the papers weren't on him, and they weren't in the stateroom either. Perhaps he had already passed them to a confederate. Yeah. That's about the only possibility left in this character. Kessler would qualify as a good suspect, except for one thing. You mean if Duvac had somehow passed the papers to him, why did he come to Duvac's room? Yeah. All of which brings us back to Susan Barlow again. You sure enough never forget a name, do you, Steve? Well, hello, Susan. Have a seat. Well, thank you. Uh, This is Lieutenant Braga. I am honored, Miss Barlow. Oh, that's nice. Care for a drink, Susan? Mm, no, thanks. I can only stay a minute. I will have a cigarette, though. I want one of mine? Uh, no, thanks. I got mine right here in my bag. You know, I think I'll try one of yours, if I may. Why, sure, Steve. Here you are. Thanks. Let me see now. I got a matchbook here somewhere. Yeah, here. here it is. <sighs> thanks. Mm-hmm. Sort of surprised to see you again, Susan. The last time, as I remember, you were all set to report me to the nearest boy scout. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, that's why I looked you up, Steve. I kind of wanted to apologize for being so testy. Oh, I thought maybe you were going to apologize for not telling me the truth. What in the world do you mean? You said you didn't know Duvac very well. Well, now, Lucky Steve, if you're going to start that again, I'm just going to pick up and leave. The steward aboard the ship told us that you and Duvac were together quite a lot, Susan. He did? Was that nosy, Parker? Well, how about it? Oh, all right, Steve. I guess I did tell you a little old fib about it. Why? Well, mainly because my recollection of Mr. Duvac is not a very pleasant one. Hmm? He represented himself to me as a gentleman. He said he could help me improve my writing. He sure enough had strange ideas about what improves a girl's writing. Oh, I see. Uh, look, did you ever hear him mention anything about any important papers he was carrying? Important papers. I wouldn't know anything at all about that. Uh, Miss Barlow, hmm? uh, did this Duvac ever speak of a man named Kessler, the person who owns this bar? No, I don't believe I remember the name. Well, I'd better be getting back to my hotel, Steve. I'm glad you stopped by, Susan. We friends again? We sure enough are. <laughs> Fine. Come and see me then here. Sure enough. A most unusual woman, Mitchell. Yeah, you figure it out. I can't. She bats those baby blue eyes and said she wouldn't know anything about any secret papers or a man named Kessler. She appears to be telling the truth. Yeah, you're exactly right. She appears to be. If she really is, that leaves us with just one lead, Kessler. Incidentally, where is he? Yes, it does seem strange that the owner of a bar would remain away from it for so long a time. I wonder if he could have skipped town with those papers. But how could he have gotten them in the first place? I don't know. But I think we'd better find out where he lives and drop in on him. What did you say the number of Kessler's apartment was, Lieutenant? Nine, according to that bartender. Nine. That's just a couple more doors down the hall. Mitchell, if Kessler is in for... Hey! That sounded as if it came from Kessler's room. Come on! Kessler! 
Lock. Come on, get back here, Lieutenant. We'll have to break down the door. Ready, one. Okay, let's go. Didn't budge it an inch. We try it again. Yeah. Ready? Yep. Richard, look on the floor. Yeah. Kessler. Uh-huh. A pair of scissors between his shoulder blades. But where could the killer have... Wait. The window is open. Yeah. See anything? Uh, there's an alley running along the side of the building, but it's too dark to see anything. Yeah, the killer could drop out of sight with no trouble at all. Mitchell, if Kessler was stabbed to death with a pair of scissors... Scissors are a woman's weapon. Precisely what I was thinking. Well, if Kessler did have those papers, he sure doesn't have them now. Only things in his pockets are a matchbook and some loose chains. Let's take a look around the room, Braga. Very well. You think Kessler had the papers and the killer took them? I don't know. That doesn't quite boil, Lieutenant. How could Kessler have gotten the papers? And if he did have them, why did he show up at Duvac's stateroom? I do not know. Hold oh, this... it. Yeah, what is it? Take a look at this ashtray. Uh, two cigarette butts with lipstick on them. Yeah, and they're the same brand as Susan Barlow smoked. Uh, who are you telephoning? Her hotel. Hello. Is Miss Susan Barlow there? What? How long ago? Thanks. She's not there? Checked out a half an hour ago. Mitchell, she is the killer. Sure looks that it way. It all fits. Remember, she left Kessler's bar before we did. That was almost an hour ago. That would give her time to check out of her hotel, come here and kill Kessler. Yeah, she could have done it, all right. I will have a dragnet put out for her at once. I suppose you'd better. Mitchell, what is the matter? Something bothers me about this setup, Lieutenant. See, what is it? I don't know. I can't quite put my finger on it, but... Hey, wait. What are you doing? Lieutenant... Do you see any other ashtrays in this room? Why, no. Only this one in front of you. Why? What's in this ashtray? Mitchell, what is the matter with you? You can see as well as I there are two cigarette butts with lipstick on them. Anything else? No, of course not. See here. You see a wastebasket in the room anywhere? Wastebasket? Why, no. Anything on the rug? Rug? No, not that I can see. Mitchell, have you suddenly lost your mind? No, Lieutenant. Matter of fact, I think I've just found it. What are you talking about? You see... If you can locate Susan Barlow anyway, will you? I'm going on a little errand. If my hunch is right, I don't have much time. I head for the ship, Southern Empress, in a hurry. Just as I get onto the dock, I see a figure hurrying down the gangway, suitcase in hand. I follow. He darts around the corner of a warehouse. I beat it after him. But when I get around the corner, all of a sudden, there he is, right beside me, with a gun jammed in my rib. Looking for me, Mitchell. Yeah, Stewart. As a matter of fact, I was. Looks like you found me. Get inside the warehouse. Okay. I think I've got it all pegged now, Stewart. Yeah, that's nice. Duvac realized that it'd probably be tough for him to get those papers ashore. He knew Kessler was waiting for him, so he made a deal with you to take the papers to Kessler. Here's the door. Open it. I figured there'd be more dough in it for you if you kept the stuff, but Kessler knew you had it. That's why he came to Duvac's stateroom. That meant you had to knock him off, which you did a half an hour ago. Come on, Mitchell, inside. Hey, why you bring me in the warehouse? Quieter. Besides, they won't find your body for days with all these crates stacked around. Well, that's a jolly thought. Now I gotta hand it to you, Mitchell. Got it all figured out. How you tumble to me, I don't know, but right now it doesn't matter. Come on, move. Where to? Straight ahead. Okay. Hey, uh, where are we going? I can't see a thing in the dark. <laughs> don't worry about that, Mitchell. Because for you, it's going to get a lot darker. I stumbled along the warehouse knowing that any moment he's going to pull the trigger. Then, as I'm feeling my way down the aisle between the crates... My hand brushes against something hanging on the edge of one of the crates. It's a cargo hook. I take hold of it, keeping it in front of me, and then, when we get to the next aisle, I suddenly whip around behind me and dive down the aisle. My arm! My arm! I'm halfway down the aisle by the time he gets his gun up. He's shooting blind. By now, I've got my own gun out of my pocket. I throw one down the aisle in his direction. Better call it a day, Stuart. You can't get out of here. I'm between you and the door. You want me to come after me, Mitchell? I guarantee a nice, warm reception. It's only a question of time, Stuart. Missed again, eh? Okay, it's my last shot for a while, Mitchell. It leaves me three still on the gun. Like I tell you, you can't get out of here. I got news for you, Mitchell. Neither can you. It's lighter over there near the door. You try to get out, you collect a slug. So like you said, it's a question of time. But I can wait as long as you can. 
All of which is getting me nowhere. It sounds like a stalemate. Then I look up. A pile of crates is about 30 feet high, and it sounds like stewards on the other side. That gives me an idea. Maybe I need a bird's eye view of him. I start climbing quietly, and it's like going up one of those pyramids. I'm almost to the top when I hear a faint sound on the other side. Then I get it. The steward has the same idea. He's climbing, too. So it looks like we're going to play king of the mountain. I flatten myself against the side of the top crate. After a few seconds, a dim figure comes into view. It's the steward holding his gun ahead of him. I hack at his wrist. You didn't need that gun anyway. That's yes, right. I did. A knife, huh? Yeah, yeah. Come on. I didn't get your wrist locked soon enough. I just paint you. It's only a sample of what I got for you. Yeah? Well, here's a little something for you, kid. Ah! Oh, the crate! The crate! Ah! Oh, brother. I climb down. The steward's done for. I fish in his pocket and find the papers I've been chasing, and then I go outside. There's a figure near the gangway. When he sees me, he hurries over. Oh, it's Lieutenant Braga. Richard, are you all right? Yeah. I traced you here to the ship. The captain told me he had seen you following the steward down the dock. Yeah, speaking of following, did you locate Susan Barlow? Oh, yes. Hey, why did she check out of her hotel in such a hurry? So she could check in at another hotel. Huh? What other hotel? Your hotel. What? Yes. She told me she had decided that you and she were going to be, uh, as she put it, sure enough, powerful friends. Oh, fine. And for this I get shot at, stabbed, and nearly drowned? Uh, but Mitchell... What made you realize that this steward was behind all this? Well, when you and I first found that cigarette of butt of Susan's in Duvac's stateroom, the steward was there. Remember? Yes, that is true, but... That gave him the idea. He probably had a chance to lift some out of her room when he was cleaning it. Then, when he killed Kessler, he used scissors and planted those cigarette butts in Kessler's room to make it look like Susan had done it. But uh, how did you know they had been planted there? Susan used matches instead of a lighter. There was a match book in Kessler's pocket. No lighter. But there weren't any matches on the ashtray. Ah, yes. You see, if there'd been only one cigarette, it could have been brought in lighted. But the fact that there were two of them with no matches made it look a little phony to me. Ah, so it would appear that the steward overlooked the one small detail of the match, which might have made his plan succeed. Yeah, I guess you might say he was almost a match for us. Dangerous Assignment stars Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner. It is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jondo, with music by Robert Armbruster, and is produced and directed by Bill Carn. Others in the cast were Bill Johnstone, Tony Barrett, Tyler McVeigh, Peter Leeds, and Betty Lou Gerson. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Who calls everybody darling? Why, Tallulah, of course. And tomorrow, Tallulah's darlings on the big show include Fred Allen, Eddie Cantor, Phil Baker, Eddie Fisher, and many more. You're invited every Sunday to the big show. And for drama tomorrow, Theater Guild on the Air presents a one-hour adaptation of Genie, starring Barry Sullivan and Margaret Phillips. Now stay tuned for The Man Called X on NBC. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize that this assignment's going to wind up with somebody trying his best to hand me a present. A load of dynamite with a lit fuse. Morning, 
Commissioner. Ruth left a note on my desk if you wanted to see me. Uh, incidentally, where is she? Down at the Red Cross Blood Bank, donating some blood. I gave her the day off. I've got a date for the same thing. Every American should donate blood to the Red Cross. But right now, take a look at this. A piece of string? Describe it to me as accurately as you can. What? Is this some kind of a game? You'll know better in a moment now. Describe that piece of string to me. Okay, okay. It's about a foot long. Eleven inches, to be exact. Okay, eleven inches. It's got four knots. Right. And they're unevenly spaced. Well, that's about all I can see. So, you're a string saver, Commissioner. Is that what you called me in here to tell me? Not exactly. In the first place, I have a hunch that's about the most important piece of string in the world right now. Why? And in the second place, it's not mine. It belonged to Jim Slater. Oh, is Jim back? That's good. Jim's dead, Steve. Well, hey, let me have that again. He was murdered in Panama the night before last. Jim Slater? Yeah, I know. He was one of your best friends, Steve. That's why I figured you'd want to take over his assignment. Yeah, I do. But I never knew what Jim was working on, Commissioner. He just dropped out of sight about a month ago. Very few people did know about his assignment, Steve. I sent him to Panama a month ago. Panama? What's going on down there? Plenty, I'm afraid. Steve, Jim Slater was down there investigating a series of thefts that have been going on for the last six months. Civilian construction camps and army engineer stations have been systematically burglarized. Look, isn't that a matter for the national police in Panama? Then what's been stolen makes it strictly our business, Steve. Oh, well, what has been stolen? No, am I. And that's what Jim Slater was working on, huh? That's right. And it looks like he was on a trail or something, Steve. They found his body in an apartment in Panama City. The apartment had been ransacked and all his papers and reports had been burned. But I still don't see what that piece of string's got to do with all this. The string was found in Slater's pocket, Steve. It was flown up here immediately. Right now, it's our only lead. Any contacts in Panama who can help me? Yes, Major Dean of Army Intelligence. Steve, get down there and work with Dean. Try to figure out what that string means. And above all, find that stolen dynamite before it's too late. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Jerry, I've got my assignment. Fly down to Panama and find out who's been stealing dynamite and where they've got it hidden before they blow up the whole joint. All I've got to go on is a piece of string that may not have anything to do with it. A real cinch. It's Tuesday when my plane lands in Panama, and I head for Army Intelligence Headquarters and Major Dean. I've been expecting you, Mitchell. Looks like a sweet mess they've dropped in your lap. Yeah. According to the commissioner, there's been enough dynamite stolen over the past six months to blow up the whole works down here. Just about. You know, there hasn't been much talk or publicity about the canal lately, but it's still just as important as ever. If, for any reason, our ships couldn't use it in the event of war, it could be pretty disastrous. I know. Look, I brought this piece of string with me, oh. Dean, and right now I'm feeling slightly foolish about it all. I don't blame you. piece of string, 11 inches long, with four knots in it. Yeah. That's supposed to be the key to the whole deal. Uh, do you think it is? I don't know what to think, Mitchell. All I know is they found it in Slater's pocket. Yeah. Well, he must have been pretty close. That's obviously why he was killed. Mm -hmm. How about his apartment? Have you got a key? Yeah, we've kept it locked up since the murder. Uh, here it is. I'll write down the address for you. Okay, thanks. I'll take a look around there and see if I can find anything that'll help make some sense out of this hunk of string. So I head for Slater's apartment. I search it from one end to the other, but all his papers have been destroyed and there's nothing in the apartment to give me any leads at all. Just as I'm finishing up, the doorbell rings. Yeah? Oh, uh, Jim here? Jim? Jim Slater. This is his apartment, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Well, look, is he here or not? Who are you? Well, my name's Ferguson. I'm a friend of Jim's. Say, what is all this? Come on in. Where is Jim Slater? Dead. What? How did it happen? An accident? No, he was murdered. Murdered? By, by whom? That's what I'm trying to find out. You say you're a friend of Jim's. He was murdered a couple of days ago. It's strange that you didn't know about it. Well, I, I've been in the interior for the last couple of weeks. Oh? Look, if I'd known he was dead, would I come up here to see him? I don't suppose so. How long have you known Slater? Just since he came down here to Panama a couple of months ago. But we seemed to hit it off real well right from the start. How did the two of you meet? 
by in a bar, as a matter of fact. Uh, look, all these questions. Who are you? My name is Mitchell. I'm a friend of Slater's, too. Oh. Did he tell you why he was down here in Panama? Well, he said he was just knocking around. I see. How about you? You work here? Yeah. I'm a civilian employee of the Army Engineers down oh, here. Oh? What kind of work do you do? Allocation of supplies, material. I see. Must be a pretty big job. Keeps me busy, all right. <laughs> I guess the Army Engineers have about every kind of supplies there are, all the way from safety pins to dynamite, huh? Yeah. Look, you any idea why Slater was killed? Not the slightest, Ferguson. I thought maybe you might be able to help me there. What do you mean by that, Mitchell? Well, just that maybe knew you knew of someone who might have a reason for killing him. Oh. Well, afraid I don't. You didn't know any of his other friends, huh? Uh, just Alice. Who's she? Alice Gaines, a nurse out at Santo Tomas Hospital. The three of us used to do the town once in a while. I'm sure she couldn't possibly have had anything to do with it. Well, probably not. Okay, Ferguson, thanks for the information. I go out to the hospital and ask for Alice Gaines. They tell me she's out on the grounds with a patient. Outside, one of the orderlies points her out to me, and she's wheeling an old fellow along in one of the walks in a wheelchair. Miss Gaines? Well, yes. I'm Steve Mitchell, a friend of Jim Slater's. Oh, Jim. You've heard about his death. Yes, I have. I'd like to talk to you for a moment, if I may. Well, all right. This is Senor Morales, one of my patients. Senor Morales? How do you do? Senor, would you excuse me? Of course, my child. I will sit here. It feels good in the sun. All right, Mr. Mitchell. Ever since I read the story of Jim's murder in the papers, I haven't been able to think of anything else. Mr. Mitchell... Who could have done such a thing? That's what I'm trying to find out, Miss Gaines. How well did you know Jim? Well, we hadn't known each other but a month or so. I felt I knew him pretty well. Well enough to worry about him anyway. Worry about him? Oh, he seemed so unsettled, just sort of drifting around. Claimed he was looking for a job, but he never seemed to be enthusiastic about it. I see. Instead, he spent a lot of time hanging around bars with some pretty unsavory characters. What do you mean by that? Oh, bunch of political agitators, people like that. I used to read the riot act to him about it. He'd just sort of laugh and kick me out of it. Now he's gone. It's pretty hard to believe. Yeah. Mr. Mitchell, do you think one of those people he used to hang around with could have killed him? I don't know. That's possible. But why? Look, you're asking me questions I can't answer right now, but thanks very much for the information you've given me. I'll see you later. <laughs> you've collected yourself a couple of suspects, Ferguson and Alice Gaines. Yeah. You think they could be working together? I doubt it. If they are, why would Ferguson tip me off about her in the first place? Uh, that's right. It doesn't figure. Now, you say that neither of them apparently knew what Slater was doing here in Panama? That's what they told me. Whether they were lying or not is something else again. Oh, uh, speaking of something else, how about that piece of string? You got any glimmer on where it figures in this deal? Not the slightest. Matter of fact, I'm beginning to think there's no connection at all. Well, you may be right. Yeah. What time is it, Steve? Twenty minutes past midnight. Well, there's not much more we can do tonight. Let's... Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Major Dean speaking. Hello, Yeah? Ben Morales from Antarctica. What? Let's have that again. Ben Morales from Antarctica. Yeah, where? Oh, that's around. I see. How long ago? Our last. Okay, we'll be right over. Something the matter? I'll say there is. That outfit must think they're really safe again now they've knocked off Slater. What do you mean? They just pulled a raid on a civilian construction company in a little town about a dozen miles from here. And got away with 50 cases of dynamite. Why? Yeah, but I think we've got one of them. They're holding him out there for us, a native named Miguel. Come on, I want to talk to this Miguel real bad. Maybe I can trade this piece of string for a real live suspect. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun tomorrow on NBC with two of your favorite families. There's The Blandings, starring Cary Grant and Betsy Drake as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings, the owners of the beautiful, expensive, and troublesome dream house. And the hilarious Harrises with Frankie, Brother Willie, Julius, and all the other favorites of the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. That's tomorrow and every Sunday for Mr. and Mrs. Blandings, starring Cary Grant and Betsy Drake, and the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show.
Now back to Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Major Dean and I take off for the construction company's camp a dozen miles out of the city. There's a man waiting for us when we pull up in front of the shop. That's right. I'm Barrows, the night watchman. Barrows? This is Major Dean. Evening, Major. Hello, Barrows. Suppose you tell us what happened. Well, I was making my rounds an hour or so ago. Thought I saw something in the shadows near one of the sheds. So I went over to investigate. And got jumped. Who jumped you? A couple of natives. Mm-hmm. I managed to clip one of them, but the other was giving me a bad time. While we were fighting, I heard a truck pull up in front of the shed where we store the dynamite. Long about then, I got tagged over the right ear and went out. Yeah, it's a nasty cut you got. But I must have been out only a couple of minutes, because when I came to, the shed door was open and the truck was just pulling away. I saw a native running after the truck, trying to get aboard. So I scrambled around in the brush, found my gun, and threw a shot after him. Did you hit him? Well, he let out a yip. The truck speeded up and the native took off into the bushes. And I followed. Five minutes later, I spied a guy hurrying along a dirt road. Same guy? Well, I couldn't be sure, but it must have been, because he was bleeding from the shoulder. But he denied having any part in it. Only thing he'd tell me was that his name is Miguel. Where is he now? Well, I bandaged his shoulder and locked him in the shack here. The shoulder? Did it look like a bullet wound to you? Sure did. Okay, good work, Barrows. Let's talk to him, Major. All right, sir. Now, here, uh, I'll just unlock this for you. Uh, thanks. Go ahead. Hello, Miguel. I don't know you. I want to ask you a few questions. Well, I don't know any answers. Why are you boys stealing dynamite? I don't steal no dynamite. What are you planning on using it for? Well, I tell you, I don't steal no dynamite. How'd you get that bullet wound in your shoulder, then? Well, it's not a bullet wound. It's a cut from a knife. Oh. Now, look here, Miguel. Just a wanna... minute, Dean. Let's have him tell us how he got the knife cut, then. Go ahead, Miguel. Well, uh, there was a fight in the container in the barn. I got in the way, and all of a sudden, <laughs> the knife cuts my shoulder. I see. Well, what were you doing near the construction camp here? Oh, just walking along the road, bleeding. Well, all of a sudden, the Americano, he jumped out at me, and he say, I steal the dynamite, and he locked me up in here. I don't steal no dynamite. You know, I think you're telling the truth, Miguel. You what? Say, I, I tell the truth. Well, I don't, don't lie. Uh, don't you think he's telling the truth, Major? Well, yeah. Yeah, I, I think he is, too. Oh, it's good to hear. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter much anymore now that we know the big boy behind the operation. Yeah, that's that's right, Steve. He's the one we're really after anyway. Okay, Miguel. You can shove off. Oh, gracias. Better keep out of these barroom brawls after this, huh? Oh, see, si, Miguel, stay out of the cantinas. Here, i better tell Barrows. Well, did you find out what you want to do from him? We're letting him go, Barrows. You're let... Hey, what's the deal? We're convinced he's innocent. Okay, get going, Miguel. Buenas noches. Are you guys crazy? If he isn't mixed up in this deal, I'll... Hold it, Barrows. Hmm? You know, Steve, you were leaving me behind there for a minute. I finally caught on. Look, will somebody kindly tell me what this is all about? I don't think Miguel's too smart. He probably figures right now that he's put one over on us, and that's just what I want him to think. I still don't see why you told him you thought he was innocent. Mitchell also told him he knew where the big boy bossing the whole operation is. Well, do you? No, but if Miguel thinks we know who his boss is, he might try to warn him. And in the process, lead us to him. Oh, I see. He's out of sight now, Dean. Come on, let's tag along. <laughs> We tail Miguel, keeping well back. He takes a dirt road to the village a mile or so away, and then he heads straight for the nearest bar. Dean and I wait a couple of minutes, and then we go inside. So Miguel was going to stay out of the cantinas, huh? Yeah, no willpower, I guess. Come on, let's ease over to this corner of the bar and try and keep ourselves as inconspicuous as okay, possible. Okay, Steve. Hey, you know, that's funny. What is? I don't see him anywhere. No, I don't either. So he didn't come in here just for a drink. You think he knew we were telling him, duck out the back door? Maybe, yeah. Uh, we'd better... Hold it. Yeah, Miguel, coming out. Turn your back. We don't want him to spot us. Right. All right. Went outside. Hmm. He must have given the message to somebody in that back room. Think we ought to crash that party back there? We don't need to. Take a look. Yeah. Big guy in a white suit. Hey, that's Parker. Who's he? He owns this bar. We've had our eye on him for quite a while. Subversive? We've always thought so. Now it looks like we were right. Watch it. He's coming by us. Got a package in his hand about the size of a book. Yeah. 
Come on, let's see who he takes it to. If it is a book, I've got a hunch it makes pretty interesting reading. Parker gets in a car outside the bar and heads for the city. Major Dean and I follow. About 30 minutes later, he pulls up in front of an apartment house and goes inside. Steve, do you think this is headquarters? The apartment house? I don't know. Could be. Let's go inside. I wonder which apartment Parker was headed for. Hey, look, there's a row of mailboxes over there on the wall. Oh, good. We'll see if we recognize any of the names. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ramimros, Brent. Hey, look at the name on mailbox number three. Alice Gaines. That's the nurse at Santa Tomas Hospital. Well, what do you know? Steve, look. Huh? Parker coming out of the door down the hall. That's her apartment, all right. Come on, out on the street. Right. Did you notice Parker didn't have the book anymore? Yeah. Come on down the sidewalk away. Right. Looks like our little game of who's who is over, Steve. That's probably why Slater struck up an acquaintance with Alice. He was trying to get a line on her. Yeah, but that still doesn't tell me what that string with the four knots is all about. Oh, look, there comes Parker. Heading for his car. Look, can you get a man to watch this apartment house? Sure, Steve. Have him tell us the minute that Alice leaves. All right. Hey, Hmm? Parker's turning around, heading back the way he came. Should we tell him? I'd like you to, Dean. I'll wait here until your man arrives. Then I'm heading for Santa Tomas Hospital. Why the hospital? Look, there was a dynamite raid last night. It was probably engineered by the boss of the operation. Right now, it looks like Alice is the boss. I just remembered someone at the hospital who can tell me whether or not Alice was on duty last night. So I head for Santa Tomas. After walking around the grounds for a few minutes, I spot the guy I'm looking for, Senya Morales. The patient in the wheelchair. He's sitting over near one of the fountains. Oh, good afternoon, Senor. Mitchell is in a... That's right, Senor Morales. I presume you would like to talk to Alice, but she is not, not on duty yet. Matter of fact, I came here to talk to you, Senor Morales. Indeed, and how may I serve you? Is uh, Alice Gaines your regular nurse? She and I have never seen a better one. She takes excellent care of me. What uh, hours are her duty hours? From four in the afternoon until midnight. How about last night? Last night? What do you mean? Was she on duty all evening? We, as far as I know... Oh, oh, wait. What is it? I just remembered I retired early, and last night I awoke about 11.30. I called for Alice, but another nurse came instead. She told me Alice had left early, complaining of a headache. I see. Well, thank you, Senor Morales. Thanks a lot. I head for Parker's bar. Dean is sitting outside in the radio car in communication with his man who's watching Alice's apartment. So far, she hasn't budged. And Dean tells me that Parker came straight back to the bar. At this point, I figure it's time I paid a visit to Parker. I find him in the back room. Hey, what's the big idea? You and I are going to have a talk, Parker. Talk? I don't know you. You will. Get out of here. Oh, no. I want to talk about dynamite. Dynamite? Oh, no. Just leave that gun where it is. Let go of me. Hey, where's that dynamite? I don't know. That refresh your memory any? I tell you, I don't know. Okay, Buster. Stop it. You had enough, huh? Yeah. Okay. Now, I want you to take a look at this piece of string with the four knots. What does it mean? I don't know. Now, look. I'm telling you the truth. I never saw that piece of string before in my life. Okay, then tell me where all that dynamite is hidden. I don't know that either. All right, Parker, you're asking for another one. Look, look, you got to believe me. I just run messages in the organization. Carried a warning to the boss. That's my job, but I... Yeah, I I saw you deliver it a little while ago in a book, wasn't it? Yeah, but honest, I don't know... What's the dynamite going to be used for? And don't tell me you don't know that or I'll... Take it easy. Okay. Yeah, I can tell you about that. In the event of war, it's going to be used for sabotage. It's already planted around various places. That I know, but I don't know where. And it's to be set off in the event of war, huh? Yeah, an hour after the boss gives a signal. Signal? What signal? Three skyrockets over Panama City. Red burst. I see. Okay. Now I'll... Another gun! Steve, you must be hard up for exercise. Yeah, I'm You better have this baby put on ice, Major. All right. My man just radioed that Alice Gaines left her apartment and took a bus. He told me which line. We can pick it up in my car. Okay, let's go. I don't get it, Steve. Alice came right here to the hospital with that book under her arm. Yeah, now she's heading down the path. Keep back. I don't want her to spot us. Wait, look. She stopped beside one of the patients. Hey, that's Senor Morales. Look, she's handing him the book. Yeah, come on. Oh, my partner's after 
Dallas, a man who said he was a friend of yours stopped by. His name is Parker. He wanted me to bring you this book. That is very kind of you, my dear Garcia. I'll take that book, Morales. Me, sir. Thanks. Now, let's see what's in it. Give it back. Steve, what's this all about? Looks like we had the wrong party peg, Steve. Yeah, here we are. A note in the front of the book. U.S. agent aware of your identity. Be careful. It's like that little gag you pulled on Miguel paid off. Very clever of you, Mitchell, but not clever enough. What? Steve. Well, I guess that gun makes you the doctor instead of the patient. Exactly. Now you will all turn around and face in the other direction at once. You won't get very far, Morales. I will take my chances on that. Let me warn you that I am an excellent shot. If any of you turn around before I am out of sight, you will be killed at once. I didn't even know he could walk. Yes, but I don't see how I can get very far. He's pretty weak. Any prolonged exertion is liable to kill him. Well, at least this explains why Slater got acquainted with Alice here. He had a line on Morales and figured this would be a good way to stay close to him. Wait, he's out of sight now. Come on, after him. But Morales had done a good job at dropping out of sight. We searched the entire grounds and surrounding area, but he's gone. Major Dean puts out a radio bulletin on him, and then we head back to Dean's office. It's after dark when we get there. I'd sure feel a lot better if we had Morales in custody, Steve. So would I. He must have been saving an escape plan for a situation like this. Well, all my boys, the National Police are alerted. Sooner or later, we've got to come up. Look, up in the sky. Skyrockets. Yeah, three of them. Red burst. Steve, that's the signal that you were telling me about. Yeah. Morales figures he might as well shoot the moon now that he's been discovered. And Parker said those charges are already planted. That's right. They'll be exploded in one hour, and we haven't the slightest idea of where they are. All right, Steve, what are we going to do? There's 20 minutes gone. We're no closer to the answer. You have all your units alerted. Certainly. I'm in radio communication with all of them. But what good's that do? I don't know where to send them. Yeah, we got to figure out where that dynamite is planted. But how, Steve? Blindfold ourselves and stick pins in a map? Trouble is, there are so many defense installations in this area, you can't cover them all. Well, you can say that again. Here, look. Huh? Here's where we are on the map. Yeah. I can take a compass with just a five-mile radius and draw a circle. Yeah. And in the area of that circle alone, there must be 50 installations. Say nothing of a couple of the canal locks. They're over here. Hey, wait a minute. What? What is it? What did you just do? What do you mean, what did I just do? I, I just drew a circle. What about it? Yeah. The string, Dean. The piece of string. Gee, that's right. Did Slater have a code map like this? Sure, sure. I gave him one. He probably burned it when he knew that they were coming after him in his apartment, but he figured out a way to tell us what he knew. Look, I put one end of the string here at headquarters. Yeah. Then I trace a circle with the other end. Now watch where those knots in the string fall on the map. All right. Are they passing over any installations? Uh, wait a minute. Yeah. One of the knots just passed over a canal lock. Copy down the code name. All right. Um, okay. Uh, another knot passed over a radar installation. All right, keep going. Okay, let's see. Third knot passes over the powerhouse. Yeah. The nearest knot. No, that just passes over a hill. Doesn't look like there's anything here, but... Hey, there's a code name on it. Brother, I wonder how he found out about that. What are you talking about? Steve, hidden in the side of that hill is the communication center for the whole canal zone. Blow that up and the entire area is paralyzed. Great. Oh, we better get word to your units. Yeah. Attention, all units in security operation. Attention. Unit Abel. Cover installation code name Watchdog. Unit Baker, take code name Gravy Boat. Unit Charlie, take code name Sad Sack. Report completion of mission. Okay, Steve, that takes care of the canal lock, the radar station, and the powerhouse. We'll take the communication center ourselves. Let's go. Here's where we turn off the highway, Steve. Hey, is that the hill up ahead of us? Yeah. They've really done a job of camouflage, haven't they? Wait a minute, look. There's a red light in the road up ahead. A tail light. Yeah, he's stopping at the foot of the hill. Somebody's getting out. Steve, it's Morales. Yeah, so he's doing the honors personally at this location. Stop the car. Okay. <laughs> I dive out and start running after Morales. He's struggling up the hill toward a clump of bushes, but he's weak, and I'm gaining on him. He throws a shot at me. It bounces out of a rock at my left, and he starts for the bushes again. He's staggering now, but he keeps going. Then he stops, points his gun at the ground, and pulls the trigger just as I jump him. Okay, drop that gun. Oh, Steve! Steve, you okay? Yeah. Oh, brother. Morales. 
Steve, is he dead? Yeah. Alice was right when she said any exertion would kill him, but he couldn't even raise his gun. Just fired into the ground. Huh? But at least he lasted long enough to know that he'd lost out. Too bad he couldn't have hung on long enough to find out the rest of his boys were picked up, too. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I got the radio report just after you jumped out of the car. All three installations covered. Seven suspects arrested, all dynamite located. Uh, that was really close, but... What's the matter, Steve? Hey, you. You hear anything? No, no, why? Oh, nothing. Hey, you know that shot? It wasn't an accident. He hit a dynamite fuse. Come on. Where is it? I don't know. Over there, Steve? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Come on, find it! I can't. Oh, here, Steve, I got it! There! Oh, brother. Oh. Hey, look, you know where I can find a real cozy spot around here? Cozy spot? What for? So I can have a nice, quiet, nervous breakdown. Move over, I'll join you. <laughs> well, one thing I'm grateful for, anyway. What's that, Steve? That it isn't the 4th of July. Why, what do you mean? If I'd have heard so much as one firecracker go off while we were shagging around after this dynamite, I'd have gone right up and smoke. Starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jondo, with music by Robert Armbruster, and is produced and directed by Bill Carn. Others in the cast were Stacey Harris, Val Brown, Kay Stewart, Byron Kane, Don Diamond, and Raymond Hartman. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another dangerous assignment. Recent figures disclose that more Americans have died on our highways than in all our wars. One main cause of death on the highway is lack of courtesy. A good rule to observe is that of America's friendly truck drivers. Courtesy and consideration to all motorists. Remember, the life you save may be your own. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's an hour and a half of the very best in music comedy and drama tomorrow on The Big Show, when MC Tallulah Bankhead's guest list includes Judy Holliday, Carmen Miranda, Jimmy Durante, Rex Harrison, and many more. And there's another outstanding one-hour production by Theater Guild on the Air also tomorrow. It's Tale of Two Cities, starring Douglas Fairbanks. Now, it's The Man Called X on NBC. Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble. But... When I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize this assignment's going to find me trying my level best to make a perfect target out of myself. Good morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you wanted to see me. I do, Steve. And you can start this assignment by painting a nice big bullseye on your chest. Oh, fine. What's the deal? You're flying to Java to look for a little piece of paper. Brother, the paper shortage must be worse than I thought. This is no ordinary piece of paper, Steve. It contains a new formula for atomic fission. Stolen from this country, huh? Right. Well, what makes you think it's in Java? The night before last, the man was killed in Java. The authorities there found half the formula on his body. What do you mean, half of it? 
The formula is in two parts, Steve. Whoever stole it didn't realize that and only got half. He probably figured on making a fortune out of it on the open market. But he must realize by now that one half is worthless without the other. In that case, he'll probably try and get that other half. Exactly. Where is it? In the custody of a British intelligence agent named Snell in Sorabaya, Java. But I still don't see where I fit in. I... Hey, wait a minute. What's that routine you were giving me about painting a bullseye on my chest? You ought to go to Java openly, Steve. Get an envelope from Snell and then return. And in that envelope is the other half of the formula? No, we're not taking any chances. In that envelope will be a blank piece of paper. But we want whoever's interested to think it's the formula. Oh, swell. You don't want to take any chances, huh? Just with my life. It stands to reason that whoever has the missing half will come after you. It also stands to reason that doing a thing like this, I could get killed. I'm not going to minimize the danger, Steve. From the moment you leave Snell's house in Java, you're a marked man. But this is the quickest way to smoke the opposition out into the open. We've got to get that missing halfback. He's a halfback? Well, quarterback, fullback, a nickel back on your bottle. Oh. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignments, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. In all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Well, I've had a lot of screwball assignments in my time, but I never thought to see the day when I'd be sending some guy a cordial invitation to kill me. It's Wednesday when my plane lands in Java, just as it's starting to rain. I fully expect to see some joker with a knife lurking in the shadows at the airport, but no one shows up. I take a cab to Snell's house, and no one answers my knock, so I try the door. It's unlocked. I shove it open. Inside, a little beady-eyed gent is just slipping a long, murderous-looking pair of scissors into a little black bag. Good evening. Oh, I thought the joint was deserted. Didn't you hear me knock? Oh, yeah. Oh, why didn't you open the door? Oh, because I will be extremely discourteous. What? You see, I'm not the one who lives here, Mr. Snell. He's the one who lives here. Yeah, I know that. Where is he? Uh, he's bathing. Uh, please to make yourself at home and mix for yourself a drink. Wait a minute. You uh, don't feel right about answering the door, but you tell me to make myself right at home? It is what Mr. Snell would want you to do. Oh. Now, if you will excuse me. Where are you going? I must leave. I'm finished here. Completely finished. And when one's work is done, one leaves. Good evening. So I mix myself a drink and wait for Snell. Then I start thinking about the little gent with the scissors. The minutes drag by and the shower is still running in the bathroom. I start getting fidgety. Then it hits me. The little guy had said his work was done here. He could have meant Snell. I run to the bathroom, jerk the shower curtain. I say. Huh? Oh, you're okay, huh? Well, I, I was at last report, old boy, but isn't it a bit thick charging into a man's bathroom like this? I'm oh, sorry, I got a little worried about you. <laughs> nice of you to be concerned, old man, but I assure you I've been taking showers most of my adult life and never had a moment's trouble. Who are you, anyway? Steve Mitchell, from the States. Oh, Mitchell, of course. Uh, uh, hand me that towel, will you, old boy? Huh? Oh, sure. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Yes, I, I've been expecting you, Mitchell. But uh, what's it's all about your being worried about me? I guess this deal's getting on my nerves already. A strange little character in your living room gave me some double talk and left. Uh, oh, that was Keller, my tailor. Taylor? Well, that explains the scissors all right. A ripping good one, too. I was beginning to wonder whether he'd been doing a little ripping on you. I say, this thing is getting on your nerves, isn't it? <laughs> Want to trade jobs? Thanks a lot, old boy, but I think this is one adventure I'll cheerfully forego. Now, if you'll be so kind as to hand me my robe. Huh? Oh, here you are. Yeah, thanks. Uh, now, as I understand it, when you leave here, you are to take the train to Batavia at the other end of the island. Oh, that's news to me. How come? Uh, slippers. Huh? Uh, slippers, old boy. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, well, I suppose it will give whoever's after you more a chance at you. Swell. Uh, come along into the next room. The envelope's in my desk. Okay. Uh, here you are, old boy. Just a blank piece of paper in an envelope. And for this, I get shot at. Well, 
Thanks, Mel. I'll be on my way. Uh, right Oh, uh, oh, just one thing. Uh, mm-hmm. I think you understand you're not to go skulking down back alleys now. What do you mean? The point is, you're to make it as easy as humanly possible for whoever wants to take a shot at you. So, with this cheerful bit of advice ringing in my ear like a funeral bell, I leave Snell's place and start walking down the street. Already the deal has gotten on my nerves, and I'm hoping that whatever happens, it happens soon. I come to a street bazaar, and remembering Snell's advice to make myself conspicuous, I start browsing around. Pretty soon, I spot the girl. Yeah, just the kind you'd see in a grade B movie, dark and slinky, with foreign agent written all over. Ah, go away, will you? The girl studiously ignoring me, so I figure it's only a question of time before she makes her pitch. Then the routine will probably go as follows. We'll have a drink somewhere, then we'll go to her apartment, then she pulls a gun on me. So the only question in my mind now is, how do we get introduced? Does she bump into me, or does she drop her purse? I'm right the first time. <gasps> Whoops, oh, pardon me. Oh, no, it was my fault. I, I was not looking where I was going. I see. Well, Fine spices no and trinkets for your lady. It was very clumsy of me, Mr. Uh... Steve Mitchell. Steve, I am Tanya. Huh. By rights about now, I should ask you if you'd like a drink, Tanya. <laughs> Why, as a matter of fact, I'd love one. Uh, the evening is so warm. Uh, mm-hmm. Is there a bar near here, I suppose? Uh-huh. Uh, just down the street. Quite a happy coincidence. Let's go. <laughs> You know, it is funny, Steve. One drink with you and I feel we've known each other for a long, long time. Uh-huh. But, but that's the way it is with me. I make up my mind quickly about people. You were perhaps surprised when I accepted your invitation for a drink so quickly. Well, no, I can't say I was surprised, Tanya. What do you mean, Steve? Why, uh, like you said, it's a warm evening. Oh, yes. Tell me about yourself, Steve. What are you doing here in Java? A fishing trip, you might say. How about you? Oh, I'm afraid I could not tell you that. Oh? I always find it hard to explain the reasons which lead me from one part of the world to another. Perhaps it is that, that I like to be where there is color and excitement. I see. And people to drink with on warm evenings. <laughs> yes. Particularly that, Steve. You know, I'm glad I'm in Java tonight. Um... But speaking of warm evenings, it is getting a little stuffy in here, isn't it? Yeah, I thought you'd begin to notice it. You got any ideas? Well, uh... You don't happen to have an apartment near here, do you? Why, Steve, you're positively psychic. Yeah, I'm a whiz. Will you take me home, Steve? Of course. My, you sound quite eager to. Well, you might say I've been waiting for this moment all evening. Come on. This is where I live, Steve. Oh, okay. Here is the key. Would you unlock the door for me? Sure, sure. There you are. Thank you. And thank you for the lovely evening, Steve. I'd ask you in, but I'm afraid it's a little late. Huh? But perhaps you will call me one day soon. Wait a minute. You mean you're not going to invite me in? But but I just told you it's rather late. Yeah, so you said... Good night, Steve. Just about the time I think I've got the whole deal figured out, Tanya pulls the big switch on me. I head back to my hotel, and now I'm more in the dark than ever. Maybe Tanya isn't the one after all, or maybe she's just playing it slow and smart. The next morning, I go down to the station and get on the train to Batavia, and even before it pulls out, I know I'm not going to be traveling alone. I see. Well, hello, Tanya. What a coincidence. Yeah, woods are full of them. But to find you on the train to Patavia when I only decided to go this morning. May I sit with you? Sure. Now, don't tell me you're not surprised to see me here on the train. Okay, I won't. You're still on your uh, fishing trip? Yep. I take it you're still looking for color and excitement. Of course. Ah, Tanya, my dear. Oh, hello, Enrique. I am indeed fortunate to find I will have such delightful company on the trip to Batavia. I am sorry, but as you see, Enrique, I already have a traveling companion. It is my loss, but 
Your game, senor. Mitchell, I am Chavez. I congratulate you. Oh, thank you. What for? For your excellent taste. For your admiration of beauty. I do claim these virtues. Okay, so we're a couple of virtuous kids. Perhaps if we were to talk further, we might discover additional things in common. Perhaps if you were to go further down the aisle, Enrique, you might uncover a vacant seat. <laughs> oh, the Aluftalia. But I'm a man of great patience, my dear. I can wait. I will undoubtedly see you later. Both of you. Nice guy. I cannot stand him. I cannot seem to get away from him. Everywhere I go, he follows me. Some hobby. Look at him, sitting there leering at me. I... What's the matter? Stephen. Hmm. That little man who is sitting next to Chavez. Hmm? Oh, you mean the gent reading the newspaper? Yes. What about him? Do you know him? No, why? He seems to be very interested in you. I've noticed him several times staring over the top of his newspaper at you. Oh? Perhaps he thinks he recognizes you. Yeah, perhaps he does. So, now all of a sudden I've got three people to worry about. Tanya, her loyal fan, Chavez, whose routine with her could have been staged for my benefit. And the little gent who's playing peekaboo with me from behind his newspaper. Any one of them could be after that slip of paper in my pocket. The question is, who... And I know that's one question I've got to answer before one of them politely arranges for me to drop dead. The hours drag by and the train starts winding through some rugged-looking jungle country. Pretty soon I get sleepy and doze off. I don't know how long I've been asleep when something brings me out of it. A hand in my breast pocket. Hey. Oh, oh I, I didn't know you were awake, Steve. That's obvious. Oh, you must think I'm a pickpocket. I wanted a cigarette and discovered I was all out and... I thought you were asleep, so I was just trying to get one of yours without disturbing you. I see. Steve! What was that? Rifle shots. And the train is stopping. Listen, did you hear that? Come on. Oh, great. Steve, we must get off the train quickly. Come. Wait a minute. But, but they will rob us, kill us. Come on, we, we can hide in the jungle. Oh, sure. I bet I'll be nice and safe in the jungle with you, won't I? What? Oh, Steve, don't just sit there. Come. Oh, okay, what's the difference? Let's go. Hurry. Hurry. The train is almost stopped. We can jump. Okay. I'll go first. Okay, come on. All right. Come, we'll get back into the underbrush and wait for the gorillas to clear out. You know, you seem to be an old hand at this. Oh, I've had experience with these gorilla band bandits before, Steve. They frequently kill for pleasure. Huh? Well, this ought to be far enough. Yes. You know, you didn't seem very surprised by this raid, Tanya. What do you mean by that? Nothing. I hold it. What's the matter? Someone's coming through the brush. Get down. But... Quiet. Chavez. Well, Senor Mitchell and Hanya, my dear. Enrique, what are you doing here? I assure you I did not wish to intrude upon your privacy, my dear, but I noticed the two of you slipping off the train into the jungle and decided it would be a wise course for me to follow also. Well, this is nice and cozy, isn't it? Just the three of us. Under some circumstances, three is considered a lucky number, Senor Mitchell. Well, I guess sooner or later I'll find out. I'm certain you will. How about the gorillas? They still going through the train? See, si. I waited until they entered the car in front of ours before I slipped off. From their shots, I gathered they were searching for guns and ammunition. And, of course, were picking up such money and jewelry as they could from the passengers. Wait a minute. Listen. The train is pulling away. Come on. Steve, we've got to catch the train. Oh! Tanya, what happened? Oh, oh I, I must have twisted my ankle. Here, I'll help you up. Thank you. Can you walk? Yes, I, I think so. I will help you. We must hurry. Never mind, we're too late. What? There goes the train around the bend. We're stranded. Oh, no. Not in this jungle. That accident of yours sure happened at the wrong time, Tanya. Or was it the right time? What are you talking Skip about? Skip I... Hmm. Looks like we're not alone after all. See, si, two other passengers sitting on the tracks over there. They must have been stranded also. Well, we might as well go over and get acquainted. Steve, look. One of those men is the one who was looking at you over his newspaper. Yeah. I suppose he got stranded accidental like, too. Who is the other man? Search me. What, oh, fellow? Fellow passengers in distress. Yeah. You got left behind, too, huh? No, uh... This train simply left without warning. Willoughby's the name, Peter Willoughby. 
Uh, this is Ben Rolt here. Uh, mine's Mitchell. This is Tanya and Chavez. How do you do? do? I see you've still got your newspaper, Van Rolt. Yeah. What about it? Oh, uh, maybe it was just my imagination, but I seemed to notice on the train that you were more interested in me than your paper. I'm sure it was your imagination, my dear Mitchell. Well, what do we do now, gentlemen? I'd say the first order of business is to get back to civilization. Marvelous specimens here and all that, but... Specimens? Uh, rare birds. I'm an ornithologist, old man. Matter of fact, that's why I was stranded. Thought I spotted a gallus gallus through the window and got off to try for a better look. What's a gallus gallus? Quite a rare red jungle bird. Quite a feather in my cap if I... Oh, I say, that's rather good, is it? <laughs> bird, feather in my cap. Yeah, yeah, hilarious. Well... I think we'd better spread out and see if we can spot any villages near here. Suppose we each try a different direction and meet back here in half an hour. That sounds like a sensible plan. Yeah. Well, come along. Mitchell. What is it, Van Ralph? I have vital information for you. Oh, what is it? We must arrange a time when we can be alone to talk. I see. But not now. The others might notice. Coming, Van Ralph. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will see you later, Mitchell. So we all fan out in different directions. I go into the jungle a little way and sit down on a stump to think things over. This deal is getting dandier by the moment. Now I've got four people to keep my eyes on. Willoughby, the bird man, Tanya, Chavez, and Van Rolf, the little gent who says he's got vital information for me. Suddenly, I realize the jungle has gotten awfully quiet. I get an itch between my shoulder blades like someone's behind me. I whirl around... And there, holding a gun on me, is Van Rolf. Stand right where you are, Mitchell. Well, so you're the boy, Van Rolf. Quiet. Right. That vital information you said you had for me, it wouldn't be a bullet, would it? Mitchell, I warn you. One move and you're a dead man. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow, you're invited to a visit with Mr. and Mrs. Blanding, the beleaguered couple who live in the famous Dream House. Cary Grant and Betsy Drake star in the title roles, and it's a delightful 30 minutes every Sunday on NBC with Mr. and Mrs. Blanding's. Sunday also brings you a refreshing meeting with Phil Harris and Alice Fay, plus Brother Willie, derisive delivery boy Julius, and helpful Frankie Remley. Come along tomorrow for Mr. and Mrs. Blanding's and the Phil Harris, Alice Fay Show. <laughs> You are listening to Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Look, Van Rout, I know what you're after. Quiet! If you think I'm going to stand here and let you plug me... Fool! Hey, look behind you. Oh, brother, a big cobra. Get out of the way, quick. Oh, it's a pleasure. That was why you were pointing that gun in my direction. Of course. As I approached, I could see the cobra was ready to strike. Huh. Thanks for the snake charming act. Now, what was this vital information you've got for me? I wanted to talk to you about... Wait. Yeah, sounds like the others are coming. Right when the others are asleep, slip away into the jungle. I'll meet you and we can talk. Okay. I say, what's all the shooting about? Steve, are you all right? Yeah. Van Rao here just killed a snake who was about to do likewise to me. Oh, senor, this jungle is not for me. I suggest we get out of here. Any of you spot any villages? Mm-mm, no. Not a thing? I spotted something. A village? No. Pavo muticus. Pavo? Oh, great. Another bird, I suppose. Green peacock. Magnificent specimen. Look, right now we're more interested in magnificent specimens of people. Well, I guess our best bet is to follow the railroad tracks. Eventually, we'll get to a town that way. But, Steve, it might take days. You got any better ideas? No, but... Neither have I, so let's go. So we start track walking. Van Rolf's in the lead, Tanya next, and then comes Chavez and Willoughby, rubbernecking at all the birds. I bring up the rear so I can keep an eye on all of them. Towards dark, we find a little clearing and stop for the night. I wait until it looks like the others are all asleep. Then I go out into the jungle a little way and wait for Van Rolf. At this point, I don't know whether his pitch about having vital information is just a trap or not, but I've got to find out. I sit there a while, wondering uneasily how many tigers there are to the square mile in this neck of the woods, and then it dawns on me that the jungle has gotten suddenly quiet again. The scream comes from my left. 
I head in that direction fast, but I don't have far to go. I round the tree, and there it is in front of me on the ground. There's enough moonlight to tell me who it is, Van Ralt. And he's wearing an ear-to-ear grin that was put there with a knife. Mitchell, where are you? Mitchell! Huh? Oh, Chavez, here I am. Oh. Oh. Van Ralt. Yeah. Somebody shut his mouth by opening his throat. Incidentally, you got here fast, didn't you, Chavez? Huh? Right. I am a light sleeper, Mitchell. I heard the scream and I came running. You sure did. What is it? What was that infernal noise? It wasn't a bird, Willoughby. <gasps> Van Ralt. Oh. Yeah, Van Ralt. But, but who did it, Steve? That's a good question, Tanya. Perhaps some natives robbed and killed him. No, I don't think so. His wallet's right here in his pocket. And... Hmm. What is it, old boy? Well, according to his papers, Van Ralt was a Dutch intelligence agent here in Java. That mean anything to any of you? No. Why should it, Mitchell? That's another good question. You and Tanya seem to specialize in them, Chavez. I say, I don't know what this blooming mess is all about, but one thing I do know. We'd better get out of here before we all get killed. I'm for pushing on the rest of the night. So it's me, Willoughby. Lead the way. I think not. What do you mean? I can't say I'm anxious to have any of you three behind me in this jungle. Particularly you, Mitchell. Oh? You're not above suspicion, you know. After all, we found you standing over Van Rowe's body. (laughs) Maybe you've got a point there, Willoughby. Okay. As long as none of us trusts each other, we'll walk side by side, just like little playmates. Come on, let's get started. Steve, I I can't go much farther. We've walked all night. How about you, Willoughby? Seen enough rare birds to last you for a while? Believe it or not, old boy, I haven't seen a one. You've been too busy trying to look over my shoulder. Chavez? I... I would welcome a rest, Mitchell. I'm not what one would call the outdoor type. Steve, look. Hmm? There's a river right ahead of us. Yeah. And a little suspension bridge. Come on. I say, old man, you don't call this rickety collection of vines and sticks a bridge, do you? Well, I admit it doesn't compare with a Golden Gate Bridge, but it looks like the only way of getting across the river. I'd sooner wait it, old boy. Be pretty tough to do against that current. Yes, it is too swift. Mitchell, this area looks familiar to me. What do you mean? Well, I visited the Van Loen plantation several years ago. I think it was in this area, but I'm not sure whether it was upstream or downstream from here. Perhaps if some of us were to go in one direction and some in the other, we might locate it. Now I think we'd better all stay together. I'm with you there, Mitchell. I wouldn't relish wandering around this jungle alone. Look, there is a path on the other side of the bridge. Yeah. That looks like our best bet. Okay, we'll cross the bridge one at a time. I'll go first. Be careful, Steve. Hey, brother, this thing is about as steady as a hula dancer's skirt. Is it holding all right? Yeah, so far, Hey, Mitchell, the bridge is collapsing. Steve! I'm all right. Water's only way steep. They, hey, the, the current's dragging me. Mitchell, watch out. The truck's ahead of you. I can't hold back. Steve, are you hurt? My arms. They're wedged into the crack between these rocks. I can't move. I'll try to get out to you, old man. No, no, the current's too strong. Spread out all of you. See if you can find that plantation. Bring back some help and hurry. So off they go, leaving me huddled against the rock in the middle of the river, wondering how long I'm going to have to wait. But as it turns out, I don't have to wait long at all. Ten minutes later, a figure steps out of the underbrush onto the river bank. It's Willoughby. Still stuck tight, old boy? Yeah. Did you find any help? No, I can't say as I did, Mitchell. That isn't surprising, because I wasn't looking for any. Huh? But, hey, why the gun? Now, isn't that fairly obvious? Oh, great. So you're the boy who's after the formula. Quite right. I suppose you've got the other half of it. Right here in my coat pocket, old boy. Quite an act you put on. Willoughby the bird lover. Amazing the things you can find out in an encyclopedia. Well, why don't you plug me and get it over with? Wouldn't think of it, my dear chap. 
shots might be heard by the others. Besides, I've got a much better plan. What do you mean? I take off my coat, fold it neatly, put it on the bank, so. Then I simply wade out to you, get the envelope out of your pocket, tap you on the head with my gun, try you loose and let you float downstream. That sounds just great, but aren't you taking a chance wading out in this current? The reward justifies the danger, old boy. Besides, as you can see, I've tied a leg of vine around a tree trunk here. I'll keep the other end in my hand. That way I can always get back to the bank if I lose my footing. Well, that's nice to know. Well, here I come. Be careful. I wouldn't want anything to happen to you for the world, old boy. Oh, I say, I must admit, you're a frightfully good sport about all these bitches. Oh, sure. Hip, hip, cricket and all that. I must give you a helpless feeling perched there with your arms caught in the rocks, watching me close in. Well, I must admit, I can think of a few thousand places I'd rather be at the moment. Well, here I am. How jolly. Now, I'll just slip my hand in your pocket and get that envelope, if you don't mind. Let me help you, old Mick. Why, you're all on the feet. They sure are. Drop the gun. Oh, why not? Oh, that's better. This whole thing was a trap. That's right. They're... Let go of me. Sure. Glad to oblige. Oh. Help! 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 Brother. Please. Please. Huh? Oh, Tanya. I, I couldn't find help. That's okay. I can get out with the help of this vine Willoughby was kind enough to rig up for me. But I thought your arms were caught in the rock scene. Sorry to send you on a wild goose chase, but I had to find out who was who, and this seemed like the best way of doing it. There. What do you mean? Let's see. Willoughby said it was in his coat. Yep, he was right. I don't understand. What does that slip of paper have to do with you? Quite it? a little, Tanya, but it doesn't matter now. It's all over. Then, then Willoughby was the one who killed Van Raal? Yeah. Willoughby was the boy I was after all along. Or, I should say, the boy who was after me. He had it all figured out, but I guess he forgot that old Chinese proverb. Proverb? Sure. Killer who pretend to be ornithologists sometime end up getting the bird. Come on. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jondo, with music by Robert Armbruster, and is produced and directed by Bill Kahn. Others in our cast tonight were Don Diamond, Alec Harford, Maria Palmer, and Paul Fries. Tomorrow, the big show's wonderful. Now, it's The Man Called X on NBC. Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble. But... When I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize this assignment's going to end up with my saving a guy's life by punching him right in the face. Morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you wanted to see me. I do, Steve. What's the deal this time? The Ketnik talks. He does? No, it is. Hey, what is this, a vaudeville routine? Yeah, you're on first. How am I doing? Well... Ah, uh, look, you better start from the beginning, Steve, huh? Steve, uh, tomorrow representatives of two Balkan countries are to meet in the border town of Ketnik. Huh? And don't start what? that again. To engage in some informal but highly important talks. To see if they can't iron out some of the difficulties that exist between them. Sounds like a good idea, Commissioner. Maybe more countries should do a thing like that, huh? Ordinarily, it would be a good idea, Steve. But there are two factors present in the situation that give the whole thing a slight aroma. Uh, what do you mean? In the first place, one of these countries, let's call it country A... 
is controlled by interests which have a long-standing reputation for not wanting to smooth things out. I see. Not only that, according to our information, they have their eyes on country B and would like some excuse to move in. Well, granted that these Ketnik peace talks don't smell so sweet under those circumstances, what business is this of ours? Ordinarily, it wouldn't be. But General Traska, the representative from country A has contacted us undercover and wants to talk to one of our agents. You've been elected. What does he want to talk about? We don't know, except that whatever it is, he insists on complete secrecy. I don't like it, Commissioner. It could be some sort of a trick. I don't like it either, Steve, but we've got to go along with it and find out what General Trasca has on his mind. Why? Because he's offering us bait we can't refuse. The return of File 72 with a seal unbroken. What? That's right. As you know, File 72 is a plan of our troop dispositions in Europe. It was stolen from this country two weeks ago. But how did General Traska get his hands on it? Who knows? And at this point, who cares? It's vital that we get that file back, Steve. Okay, how do I go about it? Well, here's the schedule. General Traska is flying his own plane across the border to Ketnik sometime tomorrow night. The next day, he's holding a press conference. You're going to attend the General's press conference, posing as a foreign correspondent. When you ask the General a certain question, that will identify you to him. Sounds like quite a lot of hocus-pocus. The general insists on absolute secrecy. And as I said before, we'll have to go along with him for the time being. Now, Steve, get over to Ketnik and find out what's on General Trasker's mind. And most important, bring File 72 back with you. Well, I said, you've got your assignment. Good luck. National Broadcasting Company is presenting transcribed Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Sure, I've got my assignment. Just a simple matter of dropping in on a trouble spot in the Balkans and arranging a secret talk with an unfriendly general right under the noses of several assorted diplomats, cops, and correspondents. A real cinch. It's Tuesday when my plane gets to Ketnik and I head for Joseph's tobacco shop. Good morning, sir. Morning. You, Joseph? Yes. You would perhaps like to look at some of my choice pipe tobacco? Yes, I would. If you've got any set aside for Steve Mitchell. Steve Mitchell. (laughs) You know, sir, it's a strange thing about names. Huh? Well, look at all these cans of tobacco on my shelves. Hmm? Each one has a name. Probably selected at random and put on them. You're asking what's in the name, huh? I am simply suggesting that they mean very little. A name is for anyone who cares to use it. Oh? Well, these credentials aren't. Uh, I see. You understand, of course, that Men in my position cannot afford to take chances. Yeah. Okay. What's the deal, Joseph? General Presco will hold the press conference in his hotel room in one hour. He will be smoking a pipe. At the end of the conference, you will ask him what kind of tobacco he's smoking. Tobacco? Yes. You will add that it smells good. He will reply that it is his own private mixture and that he will give you a sample. Okay. I've got it. Then he will arrange a private interview with you. If you wish to transmit a report of that interview to your commissioner, bring it to me and I will take care of it for you. Okay. Thanks, Joseph. I'll check with you later. Good morning. Hi. Is this General Trasker's room? Yes. The general is inside. Thanks. One moment, please. What's the matter? Why do you wish to see the general? What's it to you? I assure you it is a great deal to me. You will please answer my question. Look, before I start answering questions, I'd like to know who's asking them. I am Captain Ricci of the military. Oh, I see. Most members of the military wear uniforms. On certain occasions, it is better not to. Now you will please tell me why you wish to see General Trasca. He's holding a press conference, and I'm a newspaper correspondent. Your credentials, please. There you are, Captain. So... Steve Mitchell, Trans Ocean News Service. Well, they appear to be genuine. Appear to be? <laughs> Brother, you're really a cautious guy, aren't you? In the present situation, caution is essential, Mr. Mitchell. Just what is the present situation, Captain? One of extreme tension between my country and the country represented by General Trasker. I have been selected as the General's bodyguard while he is a guest of this country. I see. 
Well, if you'll quit bodyguarding that door, I'd like to get in on that press conference. Of course. I'll probably be seeing you. You may count on that, Mr. Mitchell. As long as this conference is in session, you will be seeing me frequently. And so in conclusion, gentlemen of the press, I would like to say simply that I came to this country as a representative of my government in peace. We seek nothing more than a friendly understanding that would pave the way toward a lasting brotherhood between our two countries. Are there any more questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, General Trasker. Yes? I wonder if you'd mind telling me what kind of tobacco you're smoking. It smells good. Uh, not at all, sir, not at all. It happens to be my own private mixture, but I would be glad to give you a sample of it. Thanks a lot, General. It's, it's no trouble, no trouble at all. General Trask uh, ushers the other correspondents out the door. I start to hang back, but he gives me a slight shake of the head. Then I see why. Captain Ricky out in the hall is counting noses as the reporters leave, so I go down into the lobby and wait. Five minutes later, the general comes down and goes over to one of the house phones. I follow him. He picks up the receiver but holds the hook down with his finger. I do likewise to the phone next to him. Keep your back turned to me, Mitchell. Okay. You got file 72, General? Yes. Is the seal still unbroken? Yes. Okay, what's on your mind? You and your country are businessmen, Mitchell. I'm certain you will approve of my little plan. That all depends on what your little plan is, General. Let us say that your country is not in sympathy with the form of government which now exists in my country across the border from here. Well, I guess you can safely say that, all right. So what? So perhaps the form of government in my country could be changed. Yeah? Who's going to change it? I am. You? <laughs> Let's have that again. My plans have been completed for weeks. I have key men in certain spots, and I will have a major part of the army behind me. You know, a thing like your planning could get pretty bloody. The end justifies the means. Oh? Just what kind of government are you planning to install in your country? I and my followers are tired of these bungling, mediocre bureaucrats who have been running our country. What we need is a strong leader, one who will rule with an iron hand. I am that leader. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, it seems to me I've heard this tune before a few times. You think your brand of government would give your citizens any more liberty than what they've got now? I am not here to discuss philosophies of government with you, but to make to you a business proposition. The return of File 72 in return for our support, huh? Precisely. Look, General, you ought to know my government better than that. You ought to know they don't go in for supporting... Mitchell, may I remind you once more that this is a business transaction... There is little room in the world today for ethics. One must be practical. Rest assured, whether I give you your file 72 or not depends on your answer to my proposition. I see. Well, uh, look, General, I don't have any power to give you an answer on a thing like that. I'd have to check with my boss. I cannot give you much time, Mitchell. How much? Twelve hours. No more. Okay. I'll see what I can do. Twelve hours, Mitchell. Jessica hangs up his phone and heads back upstairs. I know I've got to get word to the commissioner, so I go back to Joseph's tobacco shop. There's no one in the front of the shop, so I head for the back room. Dark in the room. Suddenly I hear a sound. Something creaking. I hit the light switch. Then I spot Joseph, and I know that he's just gone out of business. You can't sell much tobacco when you're dangling from the end of a rope. I didn't figure you'd be calling me direct, Steve. Is anything wrong? Yeah. The man who was going to carry the message suddenly went out of business. I see. Did you contact the party? Yeah. Let's put it this way. He wants to take over the corporation he works for, and he wants our help. I understand. You know, of course, that it's against the policy and ethics of our corporation to support a transaction like that. That's what I told him. But unless we do, he says he won't turn over that little item to us. I told him I'd transmit his proposition to you. I already knew what the answer would be, but I had to stall for time. Yeah, this is bad, Steve. You've got the pressure on it. Yeah, if I could only... Hey, wait a minute. You know, Commissioner, pressure can sometimes be reversed. What do you mean? Well, it just occurred to me the officials of the corporation he works for wouldn't like his plan much if they were to find out about him. I might use that as a sort of a lever on him. That's a good hunch. Put a work on it. I... Hello? 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 The 
Bone's dead. He's obviously been cut. I ease over to the window, and there are loose wires dangling. Then I hear someone at the front door, so I slip out the back door and head for General Traska's hotel. It looks like somebody's onto the general. That means I've got to move fast. Just as I'm entering the lobby, there's a commotion on the street outside. A few cops are wrestling with a guy, and I think I spot Captain Ricky among them. I go on up to the general's room, but he doesn't answer my knock. The door is unlocked, so I go on in. There's a figure sitting in a chair. I think it's the general, but I can't be sure because he looks like he's been worked over with a crowbar, and he's very dead. I give the room a fast frisk, but 572 is nowhere in sight. I run down to the lobby and over to the phone, but... Just as I pick up the receiver, somebody slides their thumb over the hook. Who are you calling? Get your thumb up. Oh, Captain Ricky. Captain Ricky, who are you calling? As a matter of fact, you. Oh? Why? Oh, no reason in particular. Just a little matter of General Traska being murdered. What? Yep. I thought you might be interested. Being his bodyguard, pretty careless of you, or maybe... Was it a little more than just carelessness? Mr. Mitchell, I warn you, I have too much on my mind right now to have any patience with the morbid inventions of a cheap journalist. Oh, so I'm just imagining the whole thing, huh? Well, if you'd be kind enough to step upstairs, I'd be glad to show you my morbid invention, sitting in a chair with his head bashed in. Very well. For the moment, I will indulge your imagination. Come, we will visit the general's room. Here we are. Yep, here we are, Ricky. Now we'll see whether I'm imagining things or not. There he is, sitting right... Hey, he's gone. But of course. What do you mean, but of course? I tell you, I saw him sitting in that chair dead not five minutes ago. I think you have carried your little game far enough, Mitchell. Look, it's no game, I tell you. And now I tell you. Fifteen minutes ago, General Traska left this hotel, and he was very much alive. Why? I personally saw him into his car and sent two of my men with now him. Look. So obviously he could not have been murdered in this room when he is alive somewhere else. Just a minute. In Cap- other words, Mitchell, this entire thing was only a figment of your imagination. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Whether it's comedy, music, or drama you're after, you'll find it on The Big Show tomorrow. The dynamic Tallulah is your hostess, and her guests include Fred Allen, Jimmy Durante, Vivian Blaine, Jane Morgan, and Rudy Valley. You're invited every Sunday to The Big Show. And tomorrow also means a one-hour adaptation of F. Scott Fitzgerald's exciting novel, This Side of Paradise, presented by Theater Guild on the Air and starring Richard Widmark and Nina Foch. You are listening to Dangerous Assignments, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Well, right now it looks like I've got no friends at all in this deal. Captain Ricky lied about General Traska. Why? Maybe the boys in Traska's country found out the general was trying to double-cross him and killed him. Ricky could be in league with them, and he might even be the boy who knocked off Traska. At any rate, I know I can't tell Ricky who I am and why I'm here now. I go down to the lobby and check with the desk clerk. He says he saw General Traska leave the hotel 20 minutes ago. So he's lying too. Great. I head for the bar to think things over, and then I hear a little gent telling the bartender about a big street fiesta going on down the block and about the general making a speech there. I collar the guy, and he swears he really saw General Traska there just five minutes ago. So I... Go down the street. It's a big deal with music and dancing. And general whoopie do. I stop a couple of dancers and ask him if the general was really there. Yeah, yeah. The general, he made a big speech to us. He left just a minute ago. Yeah, we all saw him. Yeah, oh. thanks. Thanks a lot. Mr. Mitchell. Huh? Who are you? I am Anton, the porter at the hotel. I, I have information for you. What about? General Traska. Look, if you're going to tell me you saw General Traska a few minutes ago, say that... But I... Hey, that this whole town is against me. Or else I really did imagine things. And at this point, I'm beginning to wonder... I assure you, Mr. Mitchell, you are not imagining things. What? I did see General Traska leave the hotel. But he was being carried out by the police. And he was quite dead. Well, so I have got one friend after all. Or have I? What do you mean? 
Why are you telling me this, Anton? <laughs> well, uh, you see, sir, a, a porter at the hotel makes very little money, and... <laughs> I get it. Okay, you just got yourself a ten-buck raise. Here. Oh, oh, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. <laughs> well, what else can you tell me? Only that shortly before they took the general's body from the hotel, they arrested the man and took him to jail. Yeah, I remember now. As I entered the hotel, I saw Ricky's boys wrestling with a guy out front. Okay, thanks, Anna. I'll see what I can find out at that jail. What do you wish? You in charge here, Sergeant? Yes, why? I understand you arrested a man near the hotel earlier this evening. I know nothing of such a way. Now, look. As you see, there is no such entry here in the records. Well, that doesn't surprise me, but do you mind if I take a look back there in the cell block? No one can go in there without a pass. Hey, well, who issues the passes? Captain Ricky. Oh, great. Will there be anything else? I guess not. I... Hey, what's all that noise? Sounds like it's coming from one of the cells. That sergeant whirls around and heads for the back of the joint. I'm right after him then. We see what causes all the noise. Two guards in one of the cells are cutting down a guy who just tried to hang himself. Then I recognize the guy. He's the same one Ricky and his boys arrested outside the hotel at the time of General Trasker's murder. At this point, the sergeant remembers me impolitely, but firmly ushers me out of the jail. I start walking down the street, and all of a sudden, I've got company. If you don't mind, I will walk with you away, Mitchell. Well, Captain Ricky, that was an interesting little sight I just witnessed in your jail. Interesting sight? I am afraid I do not understand. No, no, of course not. I mean the gent who just tried to hang himself. Oh, that. Just a harmless drunk. We had him taken to the prison hospital. Just a harmless drunk, huh? Funny. I'd swear it was the same guy you arrested outside General Trasker's hotel right after he was murdered. Excuse me, I mean right after I saw a figment of my imagination sitting in a chair, dead. For your information, Mitchell, I understand that General Trasker has suddenly decided to fly back to his own country. Oh? Which brings me to the point. What's that? You are a reporter, and a reporter without news is of no use to anyone. So? So there is no longer any news here in Ketnik. Well, maybe I suddenly like it here. The conference has been canceled. The general is leaving. I should think there would be other places where you could find much more news to write about. Okay, I got the message. And if I don't get out of town? It would be unfortunate if you had to write a story... About an accident, Mitchell. My own, of course. The next train leaves in one hour, Mitchell. I sincerely hope I will not see you here in Ketnik after that. So, now I've got just one hour to find File 72. That means I've got to find out what they did with General Trasker's body. Then I think of Anton, the little hotel porter. Maybe I can get some information out of him. I get his address from the desk clerk and go over Yes, what... Mr. Mitchell, what, I... what are you doing here at this hour? I want to talk to you, Anton. But uh, but this is late. Look, are you still interested in increasing your salary? <laughs> but, but of course. There's it's... another ten. So what do you wish to know? You say you saw the police take General Trasker's body out of the hotel. Yes, also his clothing and briefcase. Do you have any idea where they took him? Why, no, no, none at all. Anton, Anton, you must help me. Oh, it's so fool. Hey, this is the guy who tried to hang himself in jail. Oh, which I could kill you for your stupidity. You must protect me, Anton. I pretended to attempt a suicide knowing he would take me to the hospital. I escaped from there, but now the police are turning the city upside down to find me. Hey, what's this Shut all about? Shut up, Dovich. This man is a newspaper correspondent. I don't care what he is. You must protect me. It was on your orders I killed the general. Dovich! You had me brought across the border when we learned that the general was going to betray us. You said you would protect me, but now I see you never intended to. No, I'm not. No! And you next, Mitchell, Varian. Stay right where you are, Mitchell. Drop that gun. Well, Captain Ricky. I said drop it. Okay. I sort of expected to see you around here along about now. And I am not surprised to see you here. You had Tovich killed General Traska. Now he has outlived his usefulness, so you kill him. Look, <laughs> that's a pretty neat attempt to cover up, but it won't work, Ricky. Anton there on the floor killed Tovich, and he was about to do likewise to me when I jumped him. It does not matter who killed Tovich. Your plan to create an incident over the killing of the general will not work. I have kept his murderous secret so far, 
And it will remain a secret. Incident? Look, I don't follow you. It is obvious. Your interests learned that General Traska was trying to betray you. You have also been looking for an excuse to start trouble with my country. Here was a golden opportunity to accomplish both things at once. You had Traska killed here in my country, then sought to make it public, hoping this would create an incident which might provoke war. So that's why you've been keeping the murder a secret. I guess that's one for the book. You've been thinking I was working with those interests, and I've been thinking the same thing about you. It is more than a thought about you. It is a fact. I think it's about time we laid a few cards on the table, Ricky. Or should I say credentials? Here, take a look. It will do you no good to... Wait. Yeah, that's what I mean. United States government. That's right. When you started lying about Traska's murder, I thought you were working with the killers. That's why I didn't show you those credentials before. I I, I owe you an apology, Mr. Mitchell. That's okay. And I must say you did a good job of briefing your citizens about covering up the killing. I was beginning to think that I really was crazy until I met Anton. Now I see why he wanted me to know Traska really was dead. He figured I was a reporter and would make headlines out of it. I still do not understand your interest in this matter. It's very simple. General Traska had in his possession a document stolen from my country. File 72. I've got to get it back. I guess now that'll be pretty simple. You've probably got Traska's body hidden somewhere. If you just take me there, I'll go through his papers and find the thing, and then my job is done. I, uh, I'm afraid it's not that easy, Mitchell. What do you mean? I told you earlier in the evening that General Traska had suddenly decided to fly back to his own country. Now, don't start that again. Well, Traska is dead. Yes, yes, I know. But we are going to make it look like that murder was an accident and that it took place in Traska's own country. How? At this moment, one of our pilots is taking off in Traska's plane with Traska's body. Just before he crosses the river which marks the border, he will make a low-altitude parachute jump. Traska's plane will crash into some low hills... On the other side of the border. But what about that document I'm after? I placed Traska's briefcase in his plane myself. Untouched. I wanted all his papers to be in order. Oh, great. That means... Wait. Maybe I'm in the clear after all. The plane crashes, bursts into flame, and the document is destroyed. No, no. The the pilot will cut the switch before he jumps. Hmm? We want Traska's body to be in good enough condition so that positive identification can be made. Then I'm heading for the wreckage of that plane. Me... Mitchell, are you crazy? Are you insane? It will mean crossing the border and trying to escape detection by their patrols. Don't worry. I know exactly what it means. Then you must not. I also know I was sent over here to get file 72, and I'm going to get it. But, Mitchell... Where will I find that record? You, you, you cannot make it alone. Then I'll find out. Are you determined to go? What do you think? I think I had better go with you. Come. So we pile into Ricky's Jeep and head to the river, which marks the border. The airport is back about 15 miles, so it looks like it's going to be a dead heat. And it is. Just as we pull up at the river, we hear a plane overhead. The engine is cut, and we see a parachute billowing out. The plane goes into a glide, heading straight for the hills across the river. It crashed, Mitchell. Yeah. Hey, how deep is this river? We will have to swim it. This area of the border is not heavily guarded. It will take their patrols about 15 minutes to get to the scene of the plane crash. 15 minutes? It'll take us 10 of them to get across the river. Okay, come on. Start Uh, swimming, brother. There is the wreckage of the plane on that rise ahead of us, Mitchell. Yeah, no one in sight either. Good. We must work fast. I'm certain they heard the sound of the crash and we'll send a patrol. Here we are. Fuselage is still pretty much in one piece. Here, help me pry this door off the wall. All right. There. Uh, there's the general's body, all right. Where'd you put his briefcase? Uh, b- behind the seat. Okay. Brother, this plane is really torn apart. You got a flashlight, Ricky? Yes. Bring it in here. I can't see a thing. Very well. Watch it. There's a lot of jagged metal around. Yes, yes, I, I see it. Okay. Flash your light around. I... Wait a minute. There's the briefcase. Hurry up, Mitchell. Hold the light steady. There. Do you see it? Not yet, but it's going to be in here with those papers someplace. Huh? Wait a minute. There it is. Okay. Now let's get out of here. Mitchell. What is it? I hear voices. What? Wait a minute. I'll take a look out of one of the holes in the side of the plane. Oh, brother. Who is it? Two soldiers, and they're heading this way. Mitchell, if they discover us here, the whole plane will be ruined. Yeah, we'll also be slightly dead. Let's get out of the plane. Too late. 
We're too close. They'd see us. But what will we get do? Get back towards the tail. That's it. Now, get down. Keep quiet. They'll see us. Quiet. Well, this looks like one of our planes, Dimitri. Uh, shine your light in the window and we will see who... It's General Traska. General Traska. Stay on guard here, Dimitri. I will report this at once. Yes, sir. Mitchell, we are done for now. We cannot escape with the soldiers standing guard near the plane. Sooner or later, they will discover us. Yeah. Looks like we're cooked, unless... Wait a minute. What is it? Oh! Mitchell, you fool! Why did you hit me? Lieutenant! Lieutenant! See, he heard us. What is it? Quiet. The general is still alive. What? I just heard him crawl. Quick, then. Help me get him out. You must get him to a doctor at once. Yes. There. Now, help me carry him. Hurry! Well, I must admit... You are a resourceful man, Mitchell. Looks like the coast is clear. Okay, we'll slip out the other side of the plane and head back to the river. Mitchell, one thing bothers me. What is it? Why didn't you just grow on yourself instead of hitting me? I wanted to make it sound convincing. Hmm. I am not convinced. Ah, you're a skeptic. One moment. What is it now? Just this. (laughs) Hey, what's the big... Now I am convinced. I do groan much better than you. All right, come on. Let's get out of here, you. Dangerous Assignment. Starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jondo, with music by Robert Armbruster, and is transcribed, produced, and directed by Bill Karn. Others in today's cast were Tony Barrett, Paul Duboff, Raymond Burr, and Don Diamond. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another dangerous assignment. chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow, there's fun for you with two delightful families, Mr. and Mrs. Blandings and the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show. Now, here's a reminder. Don't forget to support your Red Cross and give as much as you can. When you give to the Red Cross, your gift is a lift to our fighting men. Now, hear Herbert Marshall as the man called X on NBC. Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble, but... When I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize this assignment's going to wind up with me depending for my life on a tray full of dirty dishes. Morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you had an assignment for me. I do, Steve. Your plane leaves for the Middle East in one hour. The Middle East? Don't tell me I have to crawl along that pipeline over there looking for leaks. You'll be looking for leaks, all right, but not oil. I don't get you. Steve, we're on the verge of suffering a very serious diplomatic and strategic defeat. Well, nothing like a note of cheer to start the day on, I always say. What's the deal? Take a look at this map of the Middle East, Steve. Uh Uh-huh. For some time now, we've been negotiating very secretly with this country here. What kind of negotiations? Negotiations which would pave the way for United Nations bases in that area. I see. But why all the secrecy? The country in question insisted on it. You see, they've been periodically intimidated by powerful interests to the northeast of them. They wanted to have all the negotiations concluded before any information concerning them fell into what uh, we might call the wrong hand. Wait a minute. You say there's been a leak? Is that what you're talking about? Exactly. This morning we learned through confidential sources that the document containing the complete preliminary discussions regarding military installations is now in the hands of those 
hostile interests I was talking about. What? How did that happen? That's exactly what you're flying to the Middle East to find out, Steve. I sure get all the cinches, don't I? Steve, it's vital we plug up this leak. If we don't, the entire negotiations may collapse, which would seriously <clears throat> endanger our entire position in the Middle East. You say a copy of the document got into the wrong hands. Does anybody know which copy it was? Yes, that particular copy was last in the possession of a man named Khalid. He's the Middle Eastern country's representative in the negotiations. Oh, what's his story about it? He says the document was stolen from his house. Brother, that particular story is pretty ancient. Yes, he may be lying. It's up to you to find out. Get over there, Steve. Talk to this Khalid and do whatever you have to to get to the bottom of this whole rotten mess. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, colorful two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Sure, I've got my assignment. Just a little matter of dropping over to the Middle East and investigating a government figure named Khalid to find out if he's the boy who's been peddling diplomatic secrets to the wrong parties. All of which is pretty sure to make me slightly unpopular with both the government figure and the wrong parties. Yep, I've got an uneasy hunch. I'm about to get voted the boy they'd most like to see drop dead. It's Thursday morning when my plane lands in the Middle East country and I figure my first step is to talk to this Khalid. So I find out his address and grab a taxi. It's a large house out of the city, and I walk up to the front door, and then I see that it's occupied. You have business here, perhaps? Perhaps. Now, if you'll quit blocking the door so I can knock... You wish to see Khalid, perhaps? Perhaps again, if it's okay with you. You will tell me why you wish to see Khalid, perhaps? You just spoiled your average. Look, I don't know who you are or why you're roosting in front of the door, but I came here to talk to Khalid, not you. Now, if you'll just get out of my way, I'll... Before you may talk to Khalid, it is quite necessary that I know who you are. Are you his bodyguard or something? You might say that one of my men is acting as bodyguard for the moment. I don't get it, Buster. Hama. Lieutenant Hama. Police Lieutenant Hama. Oh, police? Yes. <laughs> and now you will tell me who you are, perhaps. Here, take a look at my credentials, perhaps. So... It does not surprise me to meet a United States agent here after the unfortunate incident of the theft of the document. Yeah, but it does sort of surprise me to see a police detective here. Have you got Khalid under arrest? Let us just say he is being detained for the moment in his house. On account of the document? On account of his wife. What's his wife got to do with it? At present, nothing. Hmm. You see, last night she was murdered. What? Wait, you, you think Khalid killed her? We do not know at present. Hmm. Her body was discovered this morning in a ditch several hundred meters down the road. Uh, Come, I will show you the place. Uh, Here is the ditch where the wife's body was discovered, Mitchell. Uh, At that spot over there, to be exact. You uh, say her body was discovered this morning, Lieutenant Hama? That is correct. But the time of her death is, as near as we can learn, was sometime before midnight last night. Mm. How was she killed? Shot? Stabbed? It appears she was beaten to death. Mm. Where was her husband last night? Khalid? He claims to have been at a civic function. We are checking up on his story. Would you like to question him? In a minute. First, uh... What is it? Up here by the road, near the ditch. Those footprints? Yeah. Yes, yes, I noticed them too. A man's footprints beside the road. Of course, they're quite a few feet from the spot where the body was in the ditch. Maybe there's no tie-in, but to play safe, it might be a good idea to have a technician from your police lab come out here and check them over. I will give the necessary orders. Okay, Lieutenant. Now I'd like to go back to the house and talk to Carly and see just what kind of a story he's got for us. If there is anything I can do to help clear up this matter, I will be only too glad to do so. That's uh, being pretty cooperative, Khalid. The sooner the murder is solved, the sooner my name will be cleared of these absurd and vicious charges of betraying my country by allowing secret documents to pass into the hands of the others. Just a minute, Khalid. What makes you think your wife's murder is tied in with the other deal? Why, uh, I just assumed that it was. I see. I'd like you to tell me where you were last night, Khalid. Of course. 
Abura and I went first to dinner at Ali's restaurant. Who's Abura? My aide and secretary. Ah, go on. Then he drove me over to the new civic building. The dedication ceremony was last night. The building is not ready for use yet, as the cement work is not completed. But they wish to dedicate it anyway, and I was the principal speaker. After the ceremony, Abura and I drove back here to my home. What time was it? I would say it was about midnight when we got here. The lights were on, but my wife was missing. There were evidences of a struggle, furniture overturned, and, and blood stains. I immediately called the police. We commenced a search immediately, Mitchell, but it was not until this morning that the body was discovered. Oh, poor Saharita. Khalid, uh, did your wife have any enemies? Enemies? Somebody who had a reason for killing her? But everyone loved Saharita. She was kind and gentle. Uh, looks like at least one person didn't exactly love her. Wait. Old Mikan. Who? Mikan, our servant. My wife dismissed him several days ago. Oh, why? She would not tell me her reasons, and I did not press her. But I believe there was a quarrel between them at the time. I see. Any idea where we could find this servant? No. No, when my wife dismissed Mikan, he moved into the city. But where, I do not know. Uh, Khalid, can you describe him for us? I can do better than that. I believe there is a picture of him in one of these drawers. Ah, yes, yes. Here you are, gentlemen. Here it is. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Just one more thing, Khalid. Yes? I'm still interested in knowing why you connect your wife's murder to the other incident regarding the document. Why, uh, I suppose because the two events took place within a few days of each other. Uh, according to Lieutenant Hama, your story is that somebody stole that document from your house here. But of course. Did you have it locked up in a safe? What? Well, no, it was in a desk drawer. Oh, sounds like a pretty careless way to treat an important document, Khalid. On the contrary, I felt I was being clever, Mr. Mitchell. I reasoned that the obvious place would be the safe, and that if I merely placed the document in a desk drawer, it would be safer. But it would appear that my stratagem backfired. Yeah, it sure would appear that way. Well, come on, Lieutenant Hammer. If I may be of any further help in this matter, gentlemen, please let me know. Don't worry, we will. <clears throat> well, what do you think, Mitchell? About Khalid? Yes. I don't know, Lieutenant Hammer. He seems real anxious to help. Maybe a little too anxious. That was my thought, too. His story sounded almost rehearsed. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Yes? It is permitted to see Khalid now. I am Abura, his aide. Sure, sure. But we'd like to ask you a couple of questions first, Abura. Certainly. Were you with Khalid last evening? Yes. All evening? Why, yes. Up until the time I drove him home, which was about midnight... It was then that we discovered the disappearance of his wife. Hmm, that coincides with what Khalid told us, Mitchell. Yeah. What did the two of you do last night, Abura? Why, first we had dinner at a restaurant named Ali's, a favorite place of Khalid's. Then I drove him to the building which he was to dedicate. There was the ceremony and his speech. Uh, after that, I drove him back to his house here. I see. Well, that all checks. Okay, Abora. Thank you. Hey, you're quite welcome. Come on, Lieutenant. Yes. Well, that sort of puts Khalid in the clear, I guess. Mm. Yes, and it increases my interest in his servant great. Mikan? Yeah. I think we'd better try and locate him right now. See if we can find out just why Khalid's wife canned him. So we start checking all the hotels and rooming houses in the city. Four hours and 16 hotels later, we find a desk clerk who recognizes the picture of Mekon. He tells us that Mekon checked out an hour ago and took a taxi cab to the depot. We do likewise in a hurry. Mitchell, it would appear that our case is beginning to fall into place. Several days ago, the secret document disappears. Shortly after that, Khalid's wife dismisses the servant Mekon. Last night, Kali's wife is murdered, and now this morning, Mikan appears to be trying to flee the city. You think uh, Mikan's the boy who stole the document and knocked off Kali's wife, huh? It would certainly appear that he... Wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, that's Mikan. Come on. The train is ready to pull out. Mikan is trying to get aboard. Yeah, he's not going to make it. We're gaining on him. He is old. He cannot move quickly. Okay, Mikan, hold it. Uh, 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 so, so, Mikan, let go of me. Stand still. You seem to be in an awful hurry to get out of town, Mikan. I... I was just taking a vacation trip. Do not lie. That newspaper under your arm, it is folded to the story of the murder of Khalid's wife. That is why you were leaving. Do not deny it. I... Very well. Yes, yes, that is why I was leaving. 
I knew that I would be blamed for the killing. Oh? But I'm innocent. I swear I did not kill her. You were dismissed by her several days ago. There was a violent quarrel between you. Yes, yes. What was the quarrel about, Mikan? I... Answer! What was the quarrel about? I... I cannot tell you. Indeed. Then I have something to tell you. You are under arrest on suspicion of murder. <laughs> Mitchell, I must say, I do not understand nor enjoy your attitude. Here we have a very logical suspect, a man who can give us no alibi whatsoever for last night, and who refuses to tell us why he quarreled with a dead woman. Yet you are not satisfied. Neither are you, Hama. What? You're not trying to convince me. You're trying to convince yourself. Now, see here, Mitchell... Look, you don't believe Mekon's the murderer and document stealer any more than I do. I... Yes, yes, you are right, Mitchell. Mm. It does not seem very likely that a poor, simple old servant who had been in the employ for many years would suddenly betray his mistress' husband and kill his mistress. But if Mikan is innocent, where does that leave us? Right in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Hammer speaking. Yes? Yes? What is that? You are certain of this? I see. Very well, thank you. Well, Mitchell... Indeed, we do have the wrong man in jail. What do you mean? I am now convinced that the old servant is innocent. And moreover, I know who the guilty man is. Well, don't leave me there. That was the police laboratory. Those footprints you observed beside the road near where the wife's body was discovered in the ditch. Yeah, yeah, you were going to have the lab. They did check them and compared them with the prints of all those who had any possible connection with the case. Whose prints were they? They belonged to Khalid's aide, Abuda. chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun for you tomorrow with two of your favorite families, the Blandings and the Harrises. Mr. and Mrs. Blanding stars Cary Grant and Betsy Drake in the title roles as the proud but somewhat bewildered owners of the famous Dream House. The Phil Harris Alice Faye show stars Phil and Alice, of course, plus ever helpful Frankie Remley, Brother Willie, and Delivery Boy Julius. Yes, there are laughs tomorrow and every Sunday with Mr. and Mrs. Blandings and the Phil Harris Alice Faye show. You are listening to Dangerous Assignments, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. So all of a sudden, it looks like our case is winding up fast. We beat it back out to Khalid's house. Abura is still there. But, gentlemen, I do not understand the reason for all these questions. Nor do I. Abura is my aide. I trust him completely. Yeah? Abura, I thought you told us you were with Khalid all evening. Why, certainly. Then how do you explain the footprints beside the road? Footprints? Mm. I, I, I do not understand. We uh, spotted some footprints beside the road near the ditch where Khalid's wife's body was found. The police lab says that they're your prints, Abura. What? There must be some mistake. Indeed, there was a mistake. And it appears that you made it, Abura. Wait, wait. What is it, Khalid? But of course, Abura. Do you not remember? What are you talking about, Khalid? The car, the engine trouble. Oh, yes. The shock of being suspected made me forget. Forget what? You see, on the way home last evening, Mitchell, we had engine trouble. The car sputtered and died. Abura got out to investigate, found the trouble and fixed it. That is apparently how his footprints happen to be beside the road. Khalid, to think that we were within a few feet of your wife's body at the time. Well, Mitchell. Yeah, Lieutenant, another lead up in smoke. A very perplexing case, Mitchell. Suddenly we have no suspect. I know. Khalid couldn't very well have done it if he was dedicating a building at the time. And Khalid told us Abura left those prints beside the road while repairing the car. That appears to clear Abura. Yeah, neither one of us believes that the old servant, Mekan, did the job. Well, perhaps someone we do not know killed Khalid's wife. Yeah, but what gets me is, why was she killed? Was it to shut her mouth about something? Was there some kind of a double cross involved? If we could but answer those questions, we... What's the matter? Here, on my desk, I just noticed. There is a note for me. Ah. The laboratory technician has been trying to get in touch with us, Mitchell. 
He has something further to report. Oh, where is the lab? Downstairs in the basement. Come on, let's find out what's on his mind. Uh, here we are, Mitchell. This door on the left. Okay. Hmm. Locked? The technician must be out looking for us. You got a key? Yes, yes. We can wait for him inside. Hmm. After you. Thanks. Where's the light switch? On the wall to your left. Oh. There. Oh. Now, the I'm a, there on the floor. Yes, I see. Brother, that the technician? Yes, stabbed to death. Looks like whatever he wanted to tell us, somebody else didn't want him yes. to. Yes. So I guess now we'll never know what it was. Perhaps we will, Mitchell. What do you mean? If we are lucky. Hmm? You see, it is required that all reports to be prepared in duplicate. What? Hey, maybe the killer didn't know that. That is our one hope. Where are the duplicate copies kept? In this basket. Ah. Wait, perhaps this is it. Further report on footprints near scene of murder. Yeah, that must be it. Let's have it. Here you are. I see. I don't get it. Don't get what? He says that there were traces of cement dust on some of those footprints of Abura's near the ditch, but no cement dust on the rest of the prints. But what does that mean? I don't know. Wait, there's some more. He examined the footprints around Khalid's house. He says that Khalid's footprints also show traces of cement dust. Mitchell, this is very strange. Mm. At the scene of the crime, some of Abura's footprints contained cement dust. Others did not. Then at the house... Khalid's prints contain some of the cement dust. I do not see what... Hold it a minute. What? Yeah. I think a few things just fell into place. Look, suppose you go over the lab here and see if there are any clues to the technician's killer. I'm going over and have another talk with Khalid. But I do not understand the purpose of your visit, Mr. Mitchell. Surely I have answered all of your questions. I don't think so, Khalid. Look, I want you to think back to the evening of the murder again. Now, tell me exactly what happened. But we have been over it before. And we're going over it again. Very well. My aide, Abura, drove me into the city. We had dinner at a favorite restaurant of mine, a place named Ali's. Yeah, yeah, go on. After that, Abura drove me to the new building which I was to dedicate. And from then on, Abura wasn't out of your sight, huh? That's right. He... Well, well, of course, he had to go back to get my speech. What's that? Why, yes, I... I guess I forgot to mention that to you before. You sure did. You see, when I arrived at the new building, I discovered that my speech was missing from the pocket of my coat. I reasoned that it must have slipped out while we were dining. So I sent Abura back to the restaurant to get it. I see. How long was he gone? Oh, uh, ten or fifteen minutes, perhaps. Could it have been longer than that? Well, I suppose a few minutes more. Look, Khalid, it's very important we establish just how long Abura was gone. I know it could not have been more than a half hour, because I was scheduled to speak a half hour after I arrived, and Abura had returned with the speech before then. Wait a minute. You say that Abura brought your speech back to you? But of course, that is what I sent him after. Yeah, I could figure all right. He could have lifted it out of your pocket, then... When he came back, he handed it to you, and you figured he'd gone back to the restaurant to get it. Mitchell, I, I do not understand all I'll this. explain in a minute. Now, look, did you discover your speech was missing as soon as you arrived at the new building? Yes, as I was getting out of the car. And you sent Abura back after it right away? Yes. Hmm. So Abura, when he left, hadn't been in the new building at all? But, but yes, that is right. Of course, he came inside the building a half hour later when he returned my speech to me. Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, I'd like to know about a few locations. Locations? Yeah. That new building you dedicated, how far is it from your house here? Why, about a 15-minute ride. I see. And this restaurant where you ate, Ali's, how far is that from the new building? Why, that is also about a 15-minute drive in the opposite direction from the building. Mitchell, th these questions you are asking, surely you do not suspect that Abura is involved in this affair? Right now, it's a lot more than just a suspicion, Khalid. What? Oh, I, I cannot believe it. Well, the way it adds up. Abura swiped your speech. Then, when you told him to go back to Ali's restaurant to get it, he drove to your house instead, killed your wife, and then returned to the new building with your speech. But, but why would he kill my wife? That I'm not sure of yet, but my hunch is that it ties in with the theft of that document. Mitchell, your suspicion of Abura 
Can you prove it? That's what I'm going to find out right now, Khalid. How? I'm going over to that restaurant and talk to Ali. If he tells me that Abura didn't come back there to get your speech that night, then I guess that's the final nail in Abura's coffin. I head for Ali's. It's almost midnight when I get there, and there aren't any customers, and a little guy is sitting at a table in the center of the place all alone. Are you, Ali? Yes. What is it? My name is Mitchell. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about last night. Questions? What, what questions? Two men came to your restaurant last evening. Khalid and his aide, Abura. Uh, that is quite right. They frequently dine here. Did you see either one of them again after they left here? Yes. What? Well, don't tell me it was Abura. Why, yes. He returned about half an hour later and said that Khalid had misplaced his speech. Abura searched around the table where they had eaten, found the script, and left. Oh, fine. What is the matter? Nothing much except my airtight case just sprang a king-sized leak. I do not understand. Well, you've got company there, Ollie. I don't understand either. Abura was only gone from the new building a half an hour. It's 15 minutes each way from there to here and from there to Khalid's house. So he couldn't have gone both places during that time. If he came here, he sure couldn't have gone to Khalid's house and killed his wife. Hey, Fendi, I do not know what any of this is about, but if you are through asking questions, I suggest that you leave. It is late and I am tired. I would like to close up. Okay, Ali. Funny. I'd have sworn Abura was my boy, but right now he's looking awfully clean, so that leaves me right back where I started, fresh out of Leeds. Please, Fendi, if you do not mind. I... Okay. Hey, must be hotter than I thought in here. You're starting to sweat yes, all sir. of a sudden. Yes, sir, I'm not feeling very well. Now, if you'll please leave. Yeah, I... Yeah. I'm leaving right now. What stopped me cold is the wall behind Ali. There's a serving window there, but it's pulled down so that there's just a crack left. And in that crack, I spot a glint of metal, a gun barrel. All of a sudden, I know why Ali's sweating, and also I know I'm not fresh out of Leeds after all. I start edging towards the door, real casual-like, but I don't quite make it. That will keep you right where you are until I can get around the partition, Mitchell. Yeah, Bora, it sure will. It would appear that Ali here is not a very skillful actor. I don't know. Seems to me I'd sweat, too, if I knew you were holding a gun on me. Oh, please, Abura, do not kill me. I did as you ordered. I said everything you told me to say. I will deal with you later, Ali. You know, Abura, I think I've finally figured out why you killed Khalid's wife. Indeed? Yeah, she was the one who stole that document for you. That's probably why she fired the old servant, Mekan. He found out about it and confronted her, but... When we questioned him, he was still loyal enough to her memory not to tell us anything. Quite right. The Khalid's wife did procure the document for me, but when she learned that the United States was sending an agent over here to investigate, she became frightened. She said she was going to tell Khalid everything after he returned from dedicating the building. So you knew you'd have to shut her mouth, huh? You lifted Khalid's speech out of his pocket at dinner, and knowing he'd discover it was missing and send you after it, that gave you time to get to Khalid's house. His wife knew why you'd come. She ran out of the house. You chased her to that ditch and killed her there. It, it quite right, Mitchell. Later, you realized you might have left footprints near the ditch, so when you were driving Khalid home, you faked engine trouble at that spot and got out of the car and planted some more footsteps there as a cover, huh? May I ask how you found out about me, Mitchell? The cement dust tripped you up. You killed the lab technician to get his report. What you didn't know was that there was a duplicate copy. Uh, that was rather <laughs> stupid of me, wasn't it? Yeah. That report showed traces of cement dust in some of your prints, and none in others. I remembered Khalid telling me that the cement work in that new building wasn't even finished yet. That meant cement dust on the floors. You hadn't set foot in the building yet when Khalid sent you after the speech, so when you killed his wife and left those first footprints... There was no cement dust in them. Yeah, but later, when I pretended car trouble and got out of the car, I did have cement dust on the bottom of my shoe. That's right. Because in the meantime, you'd been inside that building while Khalid was making his speech. I admire your cleverness, Mitchell. It is a pity it comes too late for you. Oh? What happens now? Oh, to a clever man such as yourself, the answer should be quite obvious. You and Ali here are the only ones who know my little secret. Abura. No, you're not going to... I'm afraid I must, Ali... Yes, I must kill both of you. Yeah, I got news for you, Abura. You're going to have to choose which one of us to kill. What do you mean? I will kill both of you. I don't think so. 
Ollie and I are on opposite sides of the room, and you're in the center. You shoot one of us, the other will jump you. So which one of us is it going to be? Take your pick. I'm just running a bluff. Ollie's too terrified to be of any help, but the bluff works because Abura takes his eyes off me a second to shoot a glance at Ollie. And that second is long enough. I dive for the light switch. The slug whistles over me. I hug the floor in the dark and fish my gun out of my pocket. Now I'm going to wait and let Abura make the next move. Then I hear a car outside. There's light enough through the window to tell me it's Lieutenant Hama. This is just great. If he walks in that door, he'll get a slug. And if I try to warn him, I'll reveal my position, and then I'll collect the slug. I've got to think of something fast. Then my elbow bunched an object beside me, a serving cart loaded with dishes. I push it a few inches. The wheels don't make any noise. I give it a shove towards the wall and wait. Before it throws a shot in the direction of the noise, I spot the flash and let him have it. I'm okay, Lieutenant. Get the light. Kali told me you were over here. By the looks of Abura, I would say the work has been done. Yeah. Is it safe now? Uh Uh-huh. You can crawl out from under that table, Ollie. So, Abura was our killer. Yeah, he threw me off the trail by getting Ollie to give him an alibi, but I finally tumbled to it. Yeah. Abura had a pretty neat scheme, Rig, but it was that cement dust that pinned the killing on him. I guess that's what you might call concrete evidence. Assignment starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jondo with music by Robert Armbruster and is produced and directed by Bill Karn. Others in today's cast were Jan Arvan, Paul Duboff, Shep Mencken, Wally Mayer, and Don Diamond. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another dangerous assignment. <laughs> chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow, there's another hour and a half broadcast of radio's greatest show, The Big Show, starring Eddie Arnold, Jack Carson, Eddie Cantor, Olivia de Havilland, Martha Ray, and many more. Your MC on The Big Show, of course, is the glamorous and unpredictable Tallulah. And tomorrow, Theater Guild on the Air presents Light Up the Sky, starring Joan Bennett, Sam Levine, and Thelma Ritter. I'll hear Herbert Marshall as the man called X on NBC. Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble, but... When I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize that this assignment's going to prove that not only is the pen mightier than the sword, the ink bottle is mightier than the gun. Morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you had an assignment for me. I do, Steve, and your plane leaves in an hour. Oh, well, what uncivilized neck of the world do I get sent to this time? French Riviera. The way. Hey. I must have been living right lately. <laughs> hey, tell me, do they still wear those bathing suits over there, Commissioner? I'm afraid you won't have much time to be looking at bathing suits, Steve. You'll huh? be more interested in looking at an elderly man. You want to bet? Okay, so who's the elderly man? Jan Visco. Oh, the Czech author? Yes, he's been living on the Riviera since the war, Steve. He's been instrumental in smuggling quite a few worthwhile citizens out from behind the Iron Curtain. Oh, that's news to me. It should be. It's a very closely guarded secret. Because, obviously, certain interests would like very much to know who's masterminding the operation that's been a thorn in their side for the last four years. I still don't see what the deal is or where I fit in. Steve, Visco has completed all the arrangements to smuggle out into free Europe the most important man yet. Who is it? His name is Gochak. He's an atomic scientist. And he can give us a first-hand account of the status of atomic research behind the Iron Curtain. I see. Enough said. 
Where's this go check now? He's been hiding in Prague, waiting for Visco to make the necessary arrangements. This morning, we've just received word that those arrangements have been completed. Oh? Go check will arrive secretly at the Riviera tomorrow morning. You'll meet Bisco at the prearranged rendezvous, or I should say, he'll meet Bisco and you. Oh, I'm elected bodyguard, huh? Yes, and I'm sure you realize the opposition would go to any lengths to prevent Gocek from getting to us. Get over to the Riviera, work with Jan Bisco, meet Gocek, and bring him back here to the States safe and sound. And incidentally, try to stay alive yourself. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Sure, I've got my assignment. Fly to the French Riviera, check with an author named Bisco, then meet a scientist named Gocek who's being smuggled out from behind the Iron Curtain. All of which sounds just dandy, except that I've got an uneasy hunch that the gents who operate that Iron Curtain will be trying their best to drop same on my neck. It's Wednesday night, a little before midnight, when my plane lands and I put through a telephone call to Bisco's villa. Oui? Bisco? No. Oh, maybe I've got the wrong number. Is this Jan Bisco's villa? Oui. May I speak to him? Who is calling, please? Mitchell, Steve Mitchell. And may I inquire why you wish to speak to Monsieur Bisco? Look, if you don't mind, that's something I'll discuss with him now as he's there. Can I cannot come to the telephone at present? But if you will tell me the nature of your business, I will... Look, Buster, are you his official bouncer or something? Bouncer? I do not understand. Neither do I. Look, is Bisco going to be there for a while? If so, I'll come out. A good idea. And Monsieur Bisco, he will be here. Oui? I'm Mitchell. You're the guy I was talking to over the phone? Oui, please to come in. Okay. Well, did you tell Bisco that I was coming? No. What? Now, look. If you're Bisco's butler, he could do a lot better, believe me. Two items to correct, monsieur. In the first place, I am not Monsieur Bisco's butler. And in the second place, it was quite impossible to inform him that you were coming out here to his villa. Why was it impossible? Because Monsieur Bisco is in his library. Dead. What? Oui. A long and quite sharp letter opener buried in his back. And now, monsieur? What? That gun in your hand says you're the boy who stabbed him, too, huh? You are quite wrong, monsieur. This gun in my hand says that you are under arrest. Under arrest? Say, what is this? I am Inspector Marchon of the Cirité. Oh, well, I guess that clears a couple of things up. But it does not clear you up, monsieur. No? Well, maybe these credentials of mine will, Marshal. Credentials? Take a look. So, it would appear we have been at cross purposes. You see, when you telephoned, I thought you might possibly be involved in the killing. So I wished you to come out here in order that I might question you. Yeah. You say the body's still in the library? Oui, this way. What time was the killing? As near as we can place it, around ten o'clock this evening. Two hours ago, huh? There is the body, seated behind the desk, as you can see. Yeah. Files and papers scattered all over the library. Mitchell, I am completely puzzled by one element in this case. What's that, Inspector? Motive. Jan Bisco was a universally respected author. Why would anyone wish to kill him? Who was his enemy? I guess he had quite a few of them. You see, Bisco headed an operation which smuggled people out from behind the Iron Curtain, Marshal. Indeed. Ah, that explains it. If there are political implications in the killing... A very important scientist named Gocek is in the process of being smuggled out right now. He's due to arrive tomorrow morning, and Bisco was to meet him. Where? I don't know, but I'm afraid Bisco's killer does. Mitchell... Do you mean that this refugee scientist, Gocek, is walking blindly into a death trap? That's about the size of it, I guess. That means we've got to find out who killed Bisco, then trail him or her to the meeting with Gocek and just hope we get there in time. A large order. Yeah, we've only got about six hours. Where do you wish to start? With Monsieur Bisco's secretary, perhaps? Secretary? We. 
Uh, Mademoiselle Helen Nolsk, a Polish girl. She lives here. It was she who reported the murder by telephone. I see. Yeah, I'd like to talk to her. Where is she? In the next room. I, I will call her. Mademoiselle Nolsk, would you step in here a moment? All right. This is Monsieur Steve Mitchell, a government agent from the United States. How do you do, Mr. Mitchell? Miss Nolska. Monsieur Mitchell wishes to ask you some questions in connection with the murder of Monsieur Bisco. A United States government agent investigating the death of Jan Bisco? I do not understand. Oh, you weren't aware of Bisco's activities? Of course I was aware of his activities. He was a writer. Anything else? Not that I know of. I see. Now, tell me about this evening. Very well. Mr. Bisco and I worked late this evening. Here, in the library? Yes, he was dictating to me. At around ten o'clock, I went down the hall to the kitchen to prepare tea and cakes, which Mr. Bisco always liked when he worked nights. Go on. Well, while I was in the kitchen, I heard the front doorbell. I started down the hall to answer it, but Mr. Bisco called to me that he would answer it. Oh, uh, did you see who it was? No. About twenty minutes later, I... I went back into the library. It took you that much more time just to fix tea and cakes? And I also found that strange, Mitchell. As I explained to Inspector Marchand, I burned the first batch of cakes and had to prepare more. Okay, so 20 minutes later, you returned to the library. Yes, to find Mr. Bisco dead. The letter opener in his back. It was a horrible sight. Was he expecting any visitors this evening? None. But, of course, he had several friends who frequently would drop in on him. Oh, just who are these friends? Hans, Alex, Magda. Wait a minute, not so fast. Let's have them one at a time. Who's Hans? A, a pianist. He lives on the third floor of the place next door. You can see his apartment from here. Oh, his window is dark. He is either away from home or asleep. You say he was a good friend of Monsieur Bisco? Yes, you see, uh, Hans is not a very prosperous pianist, and Mr. Bisco more or less supported him. Okay, we'll check Hans later. Who's next on the list? Alex. What does he do? Why, nothing very much, I am afraid. I see. And there was a girl, Magda? Yes, a, a cafe singer. Okay, first I want to talk to Alex, the boy who does nothing for a living. Where does he live? It is a rather difficult place to find. Perhaps I had better take you there. Well, thanks. Let me see. My purse and glove should be in here somewhere. Uh, those are the ones over there on the table? Oh, yes, thank you. If you will excuse me while I freshen up, I will be with you shortly. Oh, sure. Well, Mitchell, it appears there is a long night's work ahead. Yeah, I... Hmm. What is it? I just noticed something here on the desk. Oh? You mean the paper scattered around? No, this bottle of ink that's been spilled. We oui, are noticed that. And the reason that it had been spilled by the killer is he or she searched the desk. But what about it? Part of the ink stained the top of the desk and the rest dripped onto the floor. So? Look at the stain on the top of the desk. A slight smear in the middle. Yeah. It? Killer could have got some of that ink on his or her hands. It is possible. We. Oui. And observe, Mitchell, this ink is the so-called indelible kind. Which means it won't wash off easily. So that we will know the killer when we find him. Yeah, but first we've got to find him. I am ready now, Mr. Mitchell. Okay, Helen. Did you uh, check that pianist window again? Hans? Yes, but it is still dark. Okay, let's try this boy Alex then. I'm always real interested to meet people who do nothing for a living. Just jealous, I guess. Looks like I'm specializing in guys who aren't home tonight. Uh, the door, it is unlocked. Yeah, yeah. Come on, let's take a look around inside. Oh, it is very dark in here. Yeah, I'll get the lights. Yeah. Oh, brother, this isn't exactly what you'd call a mansion, is it? Cardboard over the windows, pieces of tin over holes in the walls, the works. Mr. Mitchell, it, it seems so very warm in here. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that. Wait, that pot-bellied stove over in the corner. Why would he have a fire when the weather is so warm? That's a good question. A huh. bunch of charred papers. Let's see if I can salvage any of it. What is it? Propaganda handouts. Oh? Well, looks like Alex was a party boy, all right. Probably had a job passing this stuff out. But why burn it? Unless he decided to take a powder. Steve, do you think that Alex could have killed Mr. Bisco? Well, he looks like a pretty live prospect at the moment. What do you know about him? Why, he was an old friend of Mr. Bisco's. 
They were both in politics in Czechoslovakia and both got away together after the war. But, well, lately Alex... Well, apparently he started thinking he'd made a mistake. What do you mean? He seemed to be drifting toward the way of thought of the interests who who now control his country. I see. As a matter of fact, he and Visco argued about it quite frequently lately. Well, you're making Alex sound like a real interesting guy to me, Helen. But it's a cinch we won't find him by hanging around here. Come on. Where shall we look for him? I thought you might have some ideas about... Hey. What is it? Get down. What? Down. Got to get those lights off. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's adventure for you tomorrow. Adventure in the modern-day Wild West, as Joel McRae stars in another exciting story of the Texas Rangers. Today, as in years gone by, the Rangers are a two-fisted, courageous group keeping law and order in the West. So for action, tune in tomorrow to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And for quiz fun on Sunday evening, hear Master of Ceremonies Phil Baker as he asks America's favorite question, the $64 question. Back to Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Steve. Steve. Oh, oh thank heavens. Steve. Uh, my head. Oh, I am trying to stop the bleeding with my handkerchief. Huh? It seems to be only a scalp wound. Oh, I guess I'm luckier than oh. I deserve. What do you mean? Silhouetting us against that open doorway with the light behind us. That was real smart of me. Did you hear us see anything after I hit the pavement? No, I, I was afraid to move, Steve. I, I did hear someone running away, but that is all. Mm, could have been Alex. Steve, as we started to come outside, you were asking me if I had any ideas as to where we might find Alex. That's right. But there is a bar a few blocks from here where he frequently goes. Okay, come on. <laughs> You see him anywhere? No. No, he does not seem to be here. Okay, let's go. Oh, wait. What is it? Over there. There at the corner table. Huh? Huh? You mean that guy with his head and his arms? Yes. That looks like Alex. Hmm. The looks of that empty bottle in front of him. He's had it. Alex. Alex. Oh, well, leave me alone. Come on, snap out of it, Alex. <laughs> I... I don't know you. I... And Helen, but I don't know you. No? You sure we didn't meet a few minutes ago outside your place? I don't know what you talk about. Steve, the condition he's in, he's he's obviously been here most of the evening. Maybe. Look, Alex. You keep talking when all I want is for you to let me alone to grieve for my friend who's dead. Besco? And to think that I was in sympathy with him. Them? The ones who killed him. Huh? You know who did it? They did it. Who's they? When I hear about Bisco, I I go home. I I burn all their stinking propaganda. Look, you keep saying they and them. Let's be a little more specific. What difference does it make which one of them? It makes a big difference to me. Who was it? I don't know. Oh, fine. They're they're all alike. All of them. All alike. Oh, poor Alex. It's obvious he doesn't know anything about it, Steve. Either that or he's putting on a pretty good act. Well, shall we go now? Just a minute. I want to look at his hands. Hands? Okay, let's go. I did not see anything on his hands. Neither did I. What were you looking for? Ink. Ink? I'm afraid I do not understand. It's possible there's an indelible ink stain on the killer's hand. I see. Well, let's check the next name on the list. Magda? Yeah, cafe singer, huh? I'm interested to know what kind of a song she'll sing for me. So we head to the cafe where Magda works. She's just finished the number when we arrive, and one look at her, and I can see the reason for the ovation. Oh, look, Steve. 
Christine, she sees us. She's coming over to our table. Yeah, quite an outfit she has on. A strapless gown, it is beautiful. I'm a little more interested in those long black gloves that come clear up above her elbow. Oh? You know any subtle way of getting a lady to take off her gloves, Helen? You think there might be an ink stain on one of her hands? That's what I'd like to find out. Helen, my dear, I am so glad you stopped by tonight. Hello, Magda. I would like you to meet Steve Mitchell. Oh, hello, Steve. Magda? Oh, Ellen, this terrible thing that has happened. I can think of nothing else. Bisco's murder? Yes. Dear sweet Jan, dead. Oh, it is so hard to believe. You two should have come in sooner. My last song. I sang it in his memory. It was one of his favorites. Would you care for a drink, Magda? No, no thanks. I can only stay a moment. But a cigarette, perhaps? Oh, sure. There you are. Oh, wait. <laughs> I want to take off these clumsy gloves. Well... I thought it was going to be a problem. Oh? Uh-huh. Skip it. Oh. Would you just look at my manicure? Is it not terrible? I should have left my gloves on. I'm glad you didn't. Oh? Uh-huh. What do you mean? Well, it gave me a chance to see your hands. Oh? Uh-huh. And what about my hands? Why, uh, well, what I mean is they're, they're very nice. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, nice and white. There aren't any ink stains on either of Magda's hands. Pretty soon she has to do another number, so Helen and I leave. Near the door, Helen spots a guy she says she knows. She stops to talk to him and then joins me a couple of minutes later outside. I am sorry to keep you waiting, Steve. That's okay. That man I was talking to, he is an old friend I have not seen for some time. Okay, Helen. Let's see. I've still got one name on my list. Hans, the pianist who lives on the third floor next door to Bisco's place. Yes, perhaps he is home by now. You may find Hans a little eccentric. Oh, the flowing tie and hair type, huh? Yes. Well, let's go talk to him, see if we can find out if one of his eccentricities, by any chance, is murder. Brother, these walk-up apartments are for the birds in more ways than one. (laughs) This is the last flight. He isn't home after this elk climb. Oh, listen. Listen, I can hear the piano. He is home, all right. Here. This is the door. Helen, my dear, what a delightful surprise. Hello, Hans. Oh, come on. Come in. Welcome to my humble quarters. This is Steve Mitchell, Hans. Hi. Oh, I'm honored to meet any friend of Helen, sir. Helen, take off your coat and gloves. I will make some coffee. Oh, I... uh, I don't think we have time, Hans. This uh, isn't exactly a social call. I I, I do not understand. You see, Mr. Mitchell wants to ask you some questions. He is investigating Bisco's murder. Well, I... Wait a minute. What did you say? Bisco's murder? Helen, this is a bad thing to joke about. It it is no joke, Hans. Wait a minute. You're trying to say you didn't know Bisco had been murdered? Oh, no, no, it isn't true. Funny. Everybody else in town seems to know about it. But not I. Well, where were you this evening earlier? Oh, out for a walk. Who who did this horrible thing? Who killed Bisco? That's what I'm trying to find out. Let's see your hands. My my hands? What about them? Hmm. No ink spot. Well, hey, wait a minute. What is it, Steve? I thought you said this guy was a pianist. That's right. Of course I am. Yeah? You know, I thought there was something strange when I first came in this room. I've just figured out what it is. What do you mean? There's no piano in here. And being a pianist without one is a pretty neat trick. Yes. You're right. I sold my piano six months ago. I I needed money. But the piano music we heard as we climbed up the steps. Phonograph records. I played them for Bisco's benefit. I'm ashamed to say I have been fooling him for six months with his records. Why? Oh, he loved the sound of the music. He could hear it from his window, and I knew he was too old ever to climb these stairs and discover my trick. You see, he was like a father to me. He helped support me, and I suppose it was pride that made me do this to keep him from finding out that I was a failure. I see. Helen, this thing about Bisco being like a father to Hans... That is true, Steve. Bisco was very fond of Hans. Okay, I guess we might as well go. I'm thankful for one thing, Helen. What is that, Hans? Bisco never knew he was being fooled. Oh, well, that reminds me. If you will stop by in the morning, Hans, I have a present for you from Bisco. 
A present? Yes. Some new phonograph records he bought for you. He said he was tired of hearing the same ones day after day. The same? Oh, he, he knew. Yes, Hans, he knew. All the time he knew. Come, Steve. <laughs> I suppose it is silly of me asking you to see me home when it is just next door, Steve, but I am afraid my nerves are a little jumpy. Sure, Helen. Tell me, Steve, what did you think of Hans? Look, right now I'm not sure what I think of anything or anybody. Everybody in this deal is a character. A drunk in a bar, a cafe singer, a pianist without a piano. Everybody tells me how much they thought of Jan Bisco, and yet somebody killed him. I know. It is very puzzling. Oh, brother, four o'clock in the morning, and I'm no farther along than before. Well, thank you, Steve. That's okay. Uh, what is it? Nothing. I thought I saw something in the shadows across the street. Well, here, I'll just... turn on the porch light. Hey, no! What? Inside, quick! Steve! Steve, there was someone across the street. There sure was. What, what are you doing? Taking a look out the window. Do you see anyone? No. Oh, that was close, Steve. You're telling me. Oh, and I made it worse by turning on the porch light. I, I did not realize. You sure you didn't, Helen? What, what do you mean? I mean, maybe it's taken me a long time to catch on. Catch on? I do not understand. Put it together this way. Your boss, Bisco, headed an outfit that smuggled worthwhile citizens out from behind the Iron Curtain. What? I did not know that. No. Anyway, he'd arranged to smuggle out an important scientist named Gocek who wanted to give us some very valuable information. Some of the gents behind the curtain found out about it, and of course it didn't set very well with them. Oh, Steve, why are you telling me all Let this? Let me finish, Helen. Gocek was scheduled to meet Bisco in a couple of hours. Whoever killed Bisco did it not only to put him out of business, but also to find out where the meeting was to take place so he or she could knock off Gocek, too. But I do not understand what all this has to do with me. So you obligingly trot me around to look at all the suspects. Outside Alex's place, somebody takes a shot at me right after you'd opened the door, thus silhouetting me in the doorway. Steve! Then, as we're leaving the cafe where Magda sings, you stop and talk to a guy. We arrive here, you obligingly turn on the porch light and silhouette me again. Bang, bang. If you are trying to insinuate that I am involved in this, you are crazy. Am I? You are a perfect spot to engineer the whole deal, Helen. I tell you, I did not kill Bisco. And I am sure I don't know whatever put such an idea into your head. It was something that Hunts, the so-called pianist, said. What do you mean? He told you to take off your coat and gloves and said he'd fix some coffee. You declined. So? That made me realize that all through the evening you've had your gloves on. Well, and if I have, what of it? And all evening long I've been looking for an ink stain on somebody's hand. I didn't find it on Alex's hand or Magda's or Hunts. But I haven't checked your hands yet, Helen. Take off your gloves. Steve, this is I ridiculous. I said take them off. Very well, I will. And then you will see how absurd your suspicions of me... What's the matter? This is strange. What's strange? These gloves. Look, black gloves are black gloves. Yes, that is the point. What are you talking These about? These are not my gloves. What? Now, look. They, they look very much the same. They are the same size and they are the same color. But the stitching, it is different. I did not notice it until just now. But where'd you get them, then? I am trying to remember. Let me see... It was right here in Bisco's study. Don't you remember? Wait a minute. Yeah, we were getting ready to start out to talk to the suspects. Yes, I started looking for my purse and gloves. Then Inspector Marshall spotted them on the table. I picked them up and put them on without really looking at them. Yeah. That means somebody else picked up your gloves by mistake earlier and left her own. It also means... It that... also means I had better claim my property. <gasps> Magda. Stand quite still, both of you. Well... Looks like I figured out the deal. A little too late, though. Indeed you did, Steve. And I figured that those attempts were on my life. You were trying to kill Helen because you knew sooner or later she'd realize the gloves she was wearing weren't hers. Then we'd figure out that you must have left them here earlier when you killed Bisco. Yes, quite right. But all of that does not matter now. I suppose you found out from Bisco where he was to meet. Go check before you killed him. Oh, certainly, certainly. And I will even tell you, hmm? since you will not be alive when the meeting takes place, it will be right here in one hour. You know, Magda, there's one thing that bothers me. Uh-huh. And what is that? This bottle of ink here on Disco's desk. Some of it was spilled on the desk and there was a smear in it. I figured the killer had gotten his or her hand in it, but... It looks like I was wrong. Only as to location, Stephen. When I took off my gloves in the cafe, you were quite busy looking at my hands. If you had looked at my elbow, you would have seen the stain. 
Oh, that's why you're wearing the arm-length gloves. Hmm? Exactly. Because they, uh, they do look effective with my strapless gown, don't you think? Oh, sure, sure. I always say if I've got to be shot, I'd much rather have a girl in a white gown with black gloves do it than anyone else. I admire your sense of humor, Stephen. And now... I... Sure be a pity if anything happened to that gown, wouldn't it? What? Huh? Like this bottle of... Oh, God, you... A little too late, Mike. No. I'll take that gun. Oh, Steve. Oh, oh, oh. <sighs> Thanks for reacting like a woman, Magda. Oh. If I'd thrown that ink at your face, you oh, probably you... wouldn't have batted an eye. But it really threw you off balance when you saw the stuff flying towards that nice white gown. So, now we can meet Gocek instead of Magda. Yeah, I'm sure he'll like our kind of a reception much better than hers. Oh, that ink! That, that ink! Uh-huh. Was... If it hadn't been for that, you'd probably be still on top. Yep, it was the ink that tripped you up, coming and going. I guess you might say it sort of put a blot on your record. <laughs> Levy as Steve Mitchell with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jondo with music by Robert Armbruster and is produced and directed by Bill Carn. Others in the cast were Betty Lou Gerson, Don Diamond, Hal Gerard, Lynn Allen, and Fritz Feld. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another dangerous assignment. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's top dramatic listening this Thursday when Screen Directors Playhouse presents a one-hour adaptation of the light-hearted motion picture comedy Jackpot. Starring in this Screen Directors production are Jimmy Stewart and Margaret Truman. Yes, Margaret Truman plays her first dramatic role this Thursday with Jimmy Stewart on Screen Directors Playhouse. Here, Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X on NBC. Brian Donlevy.